Hey folks, welcome to episode 11 of the Friends Per Second podcast. This is a uh, bi-weekly, fortnightly, whatever you want to call it podcast where uh, we all convene here to talk about video games, stuff going on in video games, sometimes weird things in our lives, and uh, we got a stacked week. We're talking God of War. We also have an interview with Matt Booty from Xbox, so there's a lot. Uh, as you know, I'm Jake Baldino uh, from the internet, uh, but if you are watching this on video, this is on Skillup's channel. Shout out to Skillup. Thank you for being here. What's up, Ralph? Very, not 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 a lot of sleep right now. It's just a lot of New. video games. It's, it's, it's a lot, but it's going well. That's what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> you, hu you husk of a man. That is a preview yeah. of how I will probably <laughs> be for the rest of this podcast because I have not slept in six weeks, okay? So if I trail off into the distance and just start doing thousand yard stairs, you know why it is, okay? Just FYI. You got to do what you got to do. Uh, I am also joined by <laughs> Gerard, a.k.a. The Completionist. How are you? I am okay. Uh, I am doing well. Thank you. Uh, I, st I still have not received a God of War code. Um, I, I, have, I haven't received a Gotham Knights code. Uh, I haven't received any codes. Uh, so except just for makes one. makes you the renegade. So yeah. it's cool. I Look, you know how you had that friend that... Uh, is like always plays the games like three months after they came out when you were growing up. That's me. Uh, sure. And patient, patient gamer. That's, that's the patient, even seen that subreddit. The patient gamer. That's me. Yeah. That's yeah. literally Anyone? my. That's literally me as a person. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be here. To, I'm happy to be the patient one. Thank nice. you for having me. <laughs> the completion. The com the complete well don't 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 don't, 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 don't no don't, sorry don't, don't, i, I was don't, working don't, on something okay <laughs> anyway last but <laughs> not least we're also joined by lucy james from GameSpot and giant bomb what's up hi i'm i feel like i've got a little bit more sleep but i'm still very tired and my my like you might you're struggling with no sleep ralph i'm genuinely struggling that my wrists like the are a repetitive strain in my wrists have been oh, no. so bad that i was doing a fight in god of war yesterday and i was like Oh, I don't know if I can finish this. This really hurts. <laughs> so today, so funny. I know I'm this like, is the tired I'm, and broken podcast. Welcome everybody. Yeah, it's <laughs> I've been I've been buying what do you call it? Like the um the wrist guard stuff, like the the oh, heat no. stuff that you rub in. Sure, I'm I'm deathly scared of that injury because I'm like, there's only one thing that can bring me down. My wrists. That's that's the one thing, Damn. man. Because like, I don't need glasses. Without. I have Achilles, like... his Achilles wrists. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> like I don't need glasses. I can see, you know, into the distance. That's fine. But just don't take my wrists from me, man. I need those. Yeah. So, so not, I've been doing a lot of stretches. Do a lot of stretches. Everyone, this is a PSA. If you are a gamer or you use your phone a lot or you use a mouse and keyboard a lot, make sure to do your lots of stretches. Otherwise, you'll end up like is a, a, is a hunched it? crone like me. <laughs> 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 I, I do have a question wait uh is that for you in particular is it from using a mouse and keyboard all day or is it from a controller for being um i believe it is a mashup of controller um i think phone use as well and uh -oh. um uh yeah mouse and keyboard too it's like it's just a mix it's definitely worse on my right side because i am predominantly right-handed and obviously i use like my phone in my right hand um but i get like the the flashing pain down here and so it's not even just like the wrist it's all the way down here um sorry audio is that listening. phantom pain is that what that is yeah no, and then for sorry. some reason there's this woman who goes whoa when i pick something up <laughs> <laughs> whenever that happens whenever the pain kicks in you hear that sound you hear her yes. in the distance no and so yeah like you genuinely have to just do lots of stretches warm up the muscles because it's like they're so contracted for so long and if you don't how <laughs> you hear that? I, read this, I read this i read this quote that's like once you turn 30 you get a new permanent debuff every five years dude. and it stacks <laughs> dude, at this point it's like five months oh my god i i hate that because it's true it yeah is. yeah you know what happened to me i turned 30 and i was like this is great i'm fine everybody sucks <laughs> and then i turned 31 and then that's what it happened. And I was like, oh, oh right. no. And that's now. And I'm like, oh, yep. no. Okay. Falling apart. <laughs> no. I just can't, oh, you know, man. can't eat anything that you want anymore without, like, can't. I don't yeah. know. If I don't get, if I, I mean, I have chronic fatigue. But if I don't get, you know, if I used to run off seven hours of sleep. And now, less than nine, I'm dead. Whoa, Oof. shit. Yeah. I'm usually Nine? running on like five and I'm like, wow. yeah, man, I got five hours. I'm so lucky. <laughs> I'm running on Duncan like the rest of America. But 
Running on what? <laughs> Running on Dunkin'. <laughs> Speaking of which, this podcast what is brought to you by Dunkin' Donuts, oh, everyone. Oh, Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, I wish. I... Dunkin' Donuts and a cigarette so, as a sponsor. In San Francisco, <laughs> I, I don't even think there is a Dunkin' in San Francisco, but when I went to the East Coast last time, it was everywhere. And I Do you was need like, seven of them? Because I have them right outside. <laughs> and I was like, Jake, that is the most New York ass thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Running on Dunkin' with a cigarette. <laughs> is it literally yeah. just a store and all they sell is donuts and bad coffee? Is that it? They've expanded. Yes. There's a the breakfast menu. Good. There's a breakfast menu. That's, 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 that's only in a pinch if you're trying to catch a train. Yep. I did that as a anyway. Vegas, oh, right. a, a hangover see. Vegas morning once. Got it. Okay. Well, uh, well, <laughs> welcome what everybody. A, what a great start to the show. So that's stoked right. to be here. Very on point. Welcome Where to the Dunkin' Donuts uh, RSI uh, <laughs> <laughs> podcast. Yep. The elderly, Brought to you by the medical lobby podcast. and the fast food industry. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're playing well, both uh, sides, so we always come out on top. <laughs> that's right. Uh, there we go. Uh, we do have a lot to get into, so let's just jump into some news shall we the biggest thing today actually this just dropped a little while before recording is the playstation vr 2 now officially has a release date february 22nd 2023 pre-orders are starting november 15th and in united states money it's 550 dollars uh how much is it in australia actually- ralph eight hundred and seventy five dollars oh Which, it's like a bajillion a PlayStation- million I feel like that's right. Dollary dues. A PlayStation is seven hundred ninety nine dollars. Uh, I can't yes. really give you a comparison. I can't be like that. Can buy you three hundred cans of Coke. I don't know. But the point is, it's a lot of fucking money. No one is yeah. looking at that and thinking, "Oh, that's that's pretty cheap. I'll buy one of those." Everyone's thinking, "Holy shit, that is expensive." Just like in American dollars as well. Yes. Uh, to clarify, I believe there is a uh but there's a bundle okay so the yep. base is 550 there's a bundle that's 600 dollars. i've seen the 600 dollar us thing being thrown around a lot but that is definitely a substantial chunk of change the only other thing i just want to run down before we get into it is a, uh, 11 games announced with it after the mm. fall cities vr uh cosmonius high crossfire sierra squad the dark pictures switchback Hello Neighbor, Search and Rescue. Why am I laughing at that? I don't know. Jurassic World <laughs> Aftermath Collection, The Light Brigade, Pistol Whip, Tentacular, and Zenith, The Last City. So I am big on VR. Uh, so I don't really want to start on this, but uh, you know, Lucy, where do you fall in VR? And like, what's a, how do you feel about this price point? So I only recently, actually, you know, earlier this year, got a VR headset because I struggled a lot with motion sickness. And so um, I used to live with a friend of mine and he bought a do- an Oculus, a DK2, an Oculus, uh, back when it was still called Oculus. And um, I physically could not play it. There was actually, I can't remember what game it was. I was, I think, the first member of the press ever to play this certain VR game and it made me almost throw up because it was a first person (laughs) adventure game and they hadn't mapped it so it you you to bend down in the game you had to press b on the controller and the character would just bend down and you would obviously be stood standing and so as soon as I did that I just went okay I need to stop and so then the developer took the headset from me and then he also had a very low vr tolerance and so he was basically retching his way through playing his own game and i felt so bad oh my god that would have been so good to see it was pretty funny (laughs) but like um so for a long time i was not uh really into vr until i got to play the vive at uh gamescom one year and i got to do the underwater you know the big whale uh demo and i was like oh this is so cool i cannot move around in this though uh, and then, obviously, as technology's changed, I recently bought an, a, what is it, a Meta Quest 2, an Oculus Quest 2. Yeah. Um, which I use only for Beat Saber. I hey, genuinely don't listen, have to be anything fair, else though, on it. I just have... To be fair, I mean, valid. yeah, like this, <laughs> what great. else is? I mean, that's just, yeah, absolutely. That's money well spent right I've there. got the Lady Gaga pack. I can do telephone on. Are you doing now. the mod? Are you doing any mods? Are you doing the like the modded tracks? You got to uh, you got to go to the efforts. Uh, uh, yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. No. Um, okay. Yeah, no. Uh, I'm, Absolutely not. Record labels. I would never no, do that. But I imagine 
that Dragula would be an absolutely exceptional game to play in Beat Saber VR if it existed, I guess. Okay. But yeah, so sure. that's my sure. that's my VR. <clears throat> yeah, right. Interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I love VR. The thing I'm kind of dealing with with this is that right now, I don't know if it's just like, you know, a, a steady stream of at least somewhat decent games to keep me busy. Uh, I've, I've kind of fallen off and I even look at PSVR 2 dropping in February and I'm also looking at their release date schedule for regular games and I'm like, oh, dude, I am going to be so deep in a bunch of cool video games. Not No offense <laughs> to the VR games. I didn't, I didn't mean that. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think it's interesting because, I mean, MetaQuest Pro is $1,500. That's of course, serves a little bit of a different function in some ways. Mm-hmm. The regular MetaQuest 2, which is like arguably one of the bigger things in the game and the thing this is probably competing the most with is 400 And then Valve's still doing their crazy jump, right? stuff. Yes. Yeah, it did go up in price. Yeah. Yeah. And then Valve's, Valve's doing their index, their whole crazy thing for 1000 Um Yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm curious. Hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I, actually, I want to come back to what you said before. You said you're really into VR. I mean, yeah. like, I'm actually really surprised to hear that. Um, I wouldn't have guessed that. I don't know. Mm. Guys, in the sense that, you know, you're like, you like your very classic sort of Tony Hawk and, you know, like your, your video ass, your, your video game ass video games. Your video ass. <laughs> I'm, surpri- I'm, I'm surprised that you're really into VR. Like what, 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 how's that, how's that come about? Uh, I just, uh, so I'm an early adopter. Like I love right. tech. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be a tech sure. YouTuber. Um, right. And competing I, with uh, muck ass Brownlee. Yes, it's just it's me and him up there. That's it. Yeah, That's right. me, him, and Linus, the big three. That's what they call us. Uh, the big three. <laughs> no, uh, I, so I was excited. I had like the first uh, retail Oculus. I, you know, I had the Vive, all to the detriment of my wallet and my credit score. But uh, I, I just like trying new things. And mm-hmm. I also had a tolerance issue that I kind of just fought through. And f- thankfully, development has gotten better and better as well, where there's more accessibility settings. It definitely helps. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I kind of just fuck around and find out. That's that's what I do mostly now. I use it more just to like pop it. If I see like a weird mod or something, I'll I'll do that. Uh, but real mm. like chunky experiences. I haven't like spent a ton of time in VR since I want to say Half Life Alex came out, and I still mm. think yeah. that is like the game. I think that is the quote unquote killer app and the fact that I, I think it did well, uh, but it didn't like change the world of VR and get everybody playing. Twenty twenty uh, game think, of the year gamespot.com. It's nice. it's perfect. Yeah, sure. There's there's your Half Life three, everybody. Mm-hmm. Enjoy. <laughs> your piggies yeah, eat yeah, up. True. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean I um I yeah, I've had two headsets, two Oculus headsets. I've also got the latest one, the Meta Quest two or whatever. I mean, I'm interested in what Sony's doing here. I think it's cool because it shows that there's a major player like Sony backing VR. And that matters yeah. a lot because yeah. Xbox is not doing that. They're, Phil Spence is very on the record like, eh, I don't know about this whole VR thing. I'm going to wait and see, right? Yeah. They're more interested in AR, it seems, even though I think they've dropped the whole HoloLens development. I think that's oh, kind of dead, they? right? Am is I it, wrong about I mean, that? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But I, but I re- look, we've been talking about HoloLens for so long. If it was going to yeah. come out, it would have already come out by now. So I'm guessing it's some sort of you know commercial product now or something. I don't fucking know. But point is that X- uh, VR is not going to happen out of Xbox. It ha- it's happening on PC, but it's happening around social games and social experiences more than anything else. Like VR chat, for example. Mm-hmm. And um, these VR YouTubers, like the boys, I don't know if you guys know these, go and check them out if you haven't. Some of them are Australian. They're based in Australia, actually. Really funny guys. Um, Making just really fun, cool, interesting, weird VR content, Mm. you know. Um, And But core gaming, though, yeah, it's not picking up. And I think that Sony getting, Sony putting their money on the line on this is a big statement to the rest of the industry. It is going to attract development. And hopefully you will start seeing some more great apps come through. The challenge, though, is that like the MetaQuest, I think, is just a fantastic device mm. and yeah. it's it does the job well enough. And I don't necessarily need a more expensive headset that is tethered, by the way, yeah. that is a tethered headset 
to plug into a console. When I play VR, I don't think to myself, oh, I really wish the graphics were better. That's not it right now. I, it's more about like, I really wish they're just developing better experiences for me. I think the technology is already sufficient with the MetaQuest and I'd rather play untethered all the time. Like having a big fucking cable dangle yeah. out your back is so annoying when playing VR. So I do think that this, the, the PSVR 2 faces some stiff competition from Meta. Uh, as much as I dislike that company, they make a really good headset, yep. you know? And um, I think that's more likely to be my headset of choice in the future rather than a PSVR 2. I also just want to throw out there, and I don't know if this matters all that much, but I, I think it does kind of matter a smidge. Um, from the data that I just looked up, about 5 million PSVR 1s sold, right? Versus the 180 million player base that the PS4 currently is. 180 million plus, give or take, right? I don't know. Mm. People still can't buy PS5s. Yeah, uh, true. Yeah. And this thing is more expensive than a PS5. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I don't know who this is for just yet. Like, is is, is if it's for the loyalist of the PSVR fandom, great. Which does uh, exist. There's some people oh, that yeah. are ride or die oh, who time. just are in the PlayStation Shh. ecosystem and they're hyped. Great. I'm, sure. I'm stoked for them. So happy that they can do that. I just think that if you are going to venture into a thing like a sequel to your previous VR thing probably should have the console more available first before you start yeah. pulling the, the the ropes don't count the that, chicken well, before they're in the cart or to, whatever yeah to be fair though they did say i have heard from a few different places that supply side challenges on consoles will ease over the coming quarter and they actually expect to be pretty much caught up by quarter one next year, as in by the end of quarter one next That's year. That's nice. If, so, if they do it, if they do that, yeah. I will I will take the L on that statement and everyone can make fun of me. But No, no, but I think it's a, it's a valid point. Yeah. We don't know that they're going to do it. They just say they're going to do it, but maybe they right. don't. I mean, who knows if they're actually going to be able to deliver that, that, that stock. So, yeah, for sure. Well, here's here's what's interesting. The, the, the game's standpoint. So I think it's good that they are the ones that can fund and you know get some development going on some more traditional gaming vr things uh but the lineup is very safe along with that the elephant in the room that we haven't addressed yet is the fact that uh playstation 4 psvr games are generally not going to be compatible with psvr 2 which is nope that's that's rough dude oh, that's I, rough. they're you it's know really like you that, need that hurts to purchase. You of need. People. You need to purchase an adapter and jerry rig your PS5 to play PS4 games through the old PS. I don't think. Is that true? I haven't heard that. I've. I heard it was just not possible at all. Is there, an, is I, there some sort of I, I, I have a buddy who who legally and safely is not modding a console. Sure. Uh, there, there, there are ways to get PSVR games to run on a PS5. Um, it's mostly okay. it's mostly a hardware issue, not a software issue. It's mm, like sure. the way that the the PS the PSVR interacts with the PS4 versus the PS5. Yep. You need a couple of adapters and things like that. But it is possible. I have seen it. My buddy has played it. Um, okay. But yeah, I think that's also a very weird thing. If 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 I were Sony, I'd be like, hey, loyal PSVR customers, you're going to be buying a PSVR too. And games that were on PSVR 1 can work on PSVR 2. You have to guess that there's a, a reason why, a technology reason why they've done that, though. Mm. I don't believe that Sony would be like, we're going to make them buy all their games again. I, like, I agree. I agree. I, I, yeah. I just I just think it makes, it makes too much business sense to say to an existing user base, hey, upgrade it's safe it's a good idea it's a good story you know yeah so i i mean i can understand why people might think that maybe i'm wrong maybe it is sony just saying hey we're gonna milk people but i suspect that the way those headsets were constructed and yeah. whatever it, it, there has to be something like that absolutely you know? absolutely i just feel like if if that is the case then you know like when we all bought ps5s right you could buy a ps5 with zero games and out the box with mm -hmm. playstation plus you've got PS4 game libraries at the wazoo that are PS5 ready to go, some with PS5 patches. Sick, right? Great. What does that look like for PSVR 2 users who are about to spend up to what? Didn't you say, Ralph, like for you, it's like $850 American because you're in Australia? Uh, like, 
850 Australian dollars. So it's like, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, like that's that's a lot of money to then be like, and then I'm going to buy a game that's just as much or uh, or whatever the full price of a, play, a PlayStation VR game is, right? Like if you can find a way to reward your 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 consistent fan base every single time along the way, I think that's how you can justify those costs. But if you're not going to do that, then that's just a big bummer to me. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You got to satisfy the fans first. That's why Dwayne Johnson has been lobbying to give Grogu a gun in season three of The Mandalorian. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, yeah. I haven't had my coffee. Give him a, give him a, give him a <laughs> that, gun. I whiffed with that one. I'm sorry, guys. I, I heard him workshop a new what stuff. Are you talking right? about? I was also I was Jake. like, why is Dwayne The Rock Johnson in yeah. it? He's not in that. Uh, well, does, because he's for the fans. He saved oh. the DC Cinematic Universe. <laughs> True. It's true. Right. He he did save it single handedly. The hierarchy is about cool. to change. Yeah, it that's changed right. forever. Wait, it's, so we the hierarchy did change because now James Gunn is at the top of it. Yeah. So that's technically <laughs> true. It was him. Jake, as as the VR fan, how does this sit with you? Like both in terms of pricing, in terms of the game, because like those are the eleven new games we haven't talked about yet. There's going to be like Resident Evil Four. There's Twenty at and, launch. Yeah, there's there's a bunch yeah. more, yeah. but. Uh, it's it's really just like a wait and see purchase for me. Mm. I'd probably like as as you know, I'm not a reviewer or like gamesman of VR stuff. I'm just a consumer. Uh, I'm probably gonna wait until a couple more big titles come out. Maybe if it drops in price and stuff. The thing I'm the most excited about is just the fact that uh, I I like what Sony's been doing with hardware and design. I really thought the Dual Sense was going to be weird, and then once I got it in my hands, I really liked it. Mm. Uh, the mm. original PlayStation VR, I argue, of that generation of VR headsets, was by far the most comfortably designed. Uh, despite using cheaper materials and plastic and everything, it still managed to have this good feel to it. Uh, so I'm really mm. excited to just see how it all goes down, like controllers, mm. headsets, and all that. I also like how they kind of slowly revealed this thing. Like, they really did it for the nerds here and there they were like here's a sony playstation blog post and here's like the tech behind the controllers or here's the sensors here's the optics like i like that uh, you know it might not be like this like crazy grand strategy but for enthusiasts it's cool but mm. i'm still probably gonna wait a little bit yeah mm. have yeah, i think i think I'd, I'd be the same yeah totally have you guys played blasters of the universe no no, no. it's a that's a lucy i will kill her up I will gift you that game on on your VR. It is so fun. The, my so you guys didn't ask, but my experience with VR was uh, Oculus came to me and because I was openly against VR for many years, and then Oculus came to me and said, "We want to pay you a bunch of money to change your mind." Uh, okay. To which I said, <laughs> "Sure, let's try it." And so I I said, "Give give me your best. I'm gonna hate it." Uh, I got an Oculus Quest One, and I flipped completely wow. and I fell in love with VR and became obsessed. And uh, I eventually just started playing a bunch of VR games. And the one that I played and fell in love with was blasters of the universe. You like, you go inside of an arcade uh, arcade machine uh, to f like fight this game master who set the high score. And it's oh, like, geez. it's, it, you're, it's like in person asteroids. Like you are a floating oh, head. Shit. Your hitbox is your head and it's just constant 3d polygons shooting stuff at you. And you gotta dodge and, and dip and dive all over the place. And the more you level up, the more guns you get. And it's explosive and fun with like 80s, you know, uh, oh. wave oh, synth yeah. wave music going the whole time. <laughs> Highly recommend it. Uh, it did come out on PSVR, mm -hmm. but uh, if you got it, if you got a current VR, don't sleep on it. It's a great yeah. game. I've got, I've got the, the trailer up right now. And yeah, that looks Friends for wild. wild. Always with the sleeper. The sleeper recommendations. Yeah, sleeper, yeah, that's right. Don't sleep on it. It's good. Vampire survivors in VR. Make <gasps> it happen somewhere. Oh that's God. the future. That's your killer app right there, man. It's called, that's it's called it. Dynasty Warriors, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Vampire <laughs> Dynasty Warriors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, I don't really think there's too much more to say about this other than seeing how it goes when it releases. Mm. Uh, seeing. I think the only other I would point to is just about. I wonder if there's any play here around sort of like metaverse stuff because obviously, you know, Facebook's going all in on that. That's what they want to build. Like they're spending billions on that. And I wonder if Sony... Because obviously there's a difference between metaverse and VR, obviously. Mm -hmm. yes. For sure. Oh, yeah. But we talk about them in connected terms because certainly one vision of the metaverse is one that we 
is one that we access through VR headset and we kind of live in these worlds like Ready Player One style. Uh, I don't know, Sony, I'm not sure if... I know Sony have contributed money to Epic Games and earmarked it for the purposes of building the metaverse. I remember that. They gave them like a lot of money, in fact. So I know Sony are interested in this stuff. Um, and I wonder whether or not they have plans for this on the social side because that would be the ultimate mm-hmm. gateway into um, metaverse like if you can get vr chat and you can get it really popular across the psn then you can start building some big stuff on that you know so i do wonder if they've got that in their view at some point you know playstation home 2 yes I'm, yes well, console rights to second life the metaverse already <laughs> exists and it is second life it is. yes yeah. it does yeah. it has existed for a long mm-hmm. time don't tell the NFT bros, though. Yeah. They get very upset. Don't tell the Zuck. <laughs> don't no, tell don't the Zuck. Them. The Zuck no, he is... doesn't want any bad news right now because no. his company's losing money out the ass. He doesn't need any more bad news. Oh, boy. Yeah, what is it? The, speaking of bad news, oh, Nibel is leaving Twitter. Oh, Nibelian. Um, so for those of you who aren't hyper online, uh, this, is, this is just like a helpful thing that I've always recommended. Mm. People follow the Twitter account Nibel. Uh, it is a person who essentially just is a news aggregate. Uh, They have always kind of not necessarily had scoops or leaks, but are always the fastest to tweet stuff out. You will always see it from them first. Um, Just a very effective, useful Twitter account to follow. You have notifications on, you get your news updates. A lot Mm. of people have used that for news. He he had, or they had, uh, uh, what, over 400,000 followers? Um, so they have now officially announced that they are leaving Twitter and we just wanted to mourn that loss. Um, Gerard, you want to read the statement that they left? Sure. Uh, I, mean, I think this is just a, a portion of the statement, right? This is not the whole thing. So this, yeah. this is um, nothing on Patreon. Yeah, yeah, this is the, this is the Patreon one. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, today I will move on from both Twitter and Patreon. There won't be any games coverage for me on either platform. I've learned a lot in a short period of time. Unfortunately, I was not able to create an interesting and sustainable Patreon, which is evident in the number of patrons stagnating during the first weekend and the first of many pledges being deleted during the first week. I have miscalculated the value of my Twitter activity and realized that it is nothing worth supporting by itself. For the mass majority of the people, it is not me who is popular, but it is the work that is useful. It is not valuable by itself but a comfortable time saver, and I get that now. I was unable to create a reliable revenue stream, but I'm still happy I gave it a shot. And I want to say thank you to everybody on here who gave me a shot as well. I'll look into refunds for recent payments, have already deactivated the billing, and will likely close this page uh, this week. Uh, Nibel, it really buzzed me out to hear that statement because I just don't agree with any of it. Like, yeah. uh, like, I just, I really don't agree with the idea that the work that they were doing was not extremely valuable. Um, and, you know, he's, he said something like, oh, it was not me that was popular. It was the work that I was doing. And it's like, well, same for most of us. I mean, mm-hmm. like, I don't know. Like, uh, like well, I don't really, I mean, partly, I look, I don't think part, I think people watch me, for example, for the work that I do. I don't think they watch me because they're like, I really like Ralph. I want to hang out with, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I don't it's not care like what that. you I had for think, dinner, man. <laughs> people do not give a shit what I had for dinner, okay? They want to know about the video game. And, but I still think that that is a thing that I contributed and I'm happy with that contribution. I'm proud of that contribution. And I think he contributed a lot, like just a lot. And to yeah. be able to curate news at that level for so many people, surface so many things in such a timely and concise fashion, that is an actual skill set. That is yeah. a thing. You pay top dollar for that. You know what I mean? It's like if I was running an outlet, I would hire N- Nibel in an oh, instant. Immediate, to be like, cool, immediately, immediately, help. IGN... Kotaku, GameSpot, totally. someone pick them up. Like, this is the time. So I'll message. I just disagree with, I mean, obviously, maybe they have other stuff going on in the background, their lives, but I really disagree with what they've said here. Obviously, it's right for them. I'm not telling them what their feeling is incorrect. But what I'm saying is that I think if he's of a view that he is not valued, that is incorrect. If he's of a view that his skills are not valuable in the marketplace, that is not yep. correct. I think judging your value on the basis of a Patreon is a bad idea. 
Um, and I think that there are other ways for him to, there would have been other ways for him to make a career in this and stick with it. And mm-hmm. I don't know. Nibel, if you're watching, please come back is what yeah. I'm saying. We need you, man. We need you to just do your thing. Just- come Absolutely. on the show. Yeah, man. Come yeah. on the show. Like that's You're invited as a guest. Yeah. It's just, yeah. you know, as, you know, people who cover shows and stuff, I, I don't know about you guys, but like every time I saw, I always called him Nebelian to rhyme with sure. rebellion. So I, I will say that. Um, but like I always saw Nebelian just tweeting, like um, getting screen grabs, getting gifts, and just putting everything up and just managing to like, you know, we'll be we'll be like on the GameSpot side, churning. like trying to yeah. grab trailers and stuff. And I'm like, shit, did anyone get the name of this game? And like Nebelian's got it. Like it's it was it wasn't yeah. only just you know fast work; it was good work. And like. I hate totally. that they're saying like I miscalculated the value, and it's like no, man. This is like yeah, you. Well, I, 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 I mean, I feel I feel though if they feel like they had an unhealthy relationship with Twitter and they wanted to step away because of that, totally accept yeah, it. Yeah. They are, they did also say like obviously with everything going on at Twitter right now, and please, it's been on my feed and, and it's kind of just immensely depressing. Um, so we'll not delve we into that. We don't want to talk about Elon Musk. We'll, okay. we'll not delve into that one too deeply, but like, yeah, he, do, he doesn't necessarily understand the way or trust the way that the platform is going, which is also a completely fair thing. But I think sure. it does leave this like, I I don't think Nebelian understands the vacuum that they have left. I agree. And yeah. I think as well, there's been lots of commentary about the fact that a platform like Twitter should ultimately be rewarded. Like every other social media platform will generally re- reward you if you are at the pinnacle of it yep. uh, for the content that you create. Whereas now, if you're at the pinnacle, you have to pay eight dollars a month. <laughs> you know Paying I mean? eight dollars like, a month for simple <laughs> fucking moder- for uh, moderation basic, tools is <laughs> exactly. You know, it's it's so yeah. it's it's ridiculous that Twitter hasn't found a way to reward those top level creators that keep people. Because I will be engaging less Twitter now, I think, as a result of Nobelian's absence. Mm. You know, I, I think that. And so, and it's like if if Twitter was smart, they would have found a way to find those, to, to reward those people and make it so they can have a career and do their thing on Twitter the same way that we have it on YouTube. You know, mm. we are incentivized to stay here and create. Uh, Twitter does not do that. And um, it's a shame. Yeah. I think it shows the power of, uh, I have tried every single news aggregate app and oh, i've tried Feedly. apple news i've yeah. tried all the, none of them no. i think it, it proved that there is a good human element mm-hmm. to some news yes. curation where specifically with this it was like he was down to giving me the bullet points i wanted mm-hmm. like i it was exactly what i wanted to know he would describe a new game in the language that the audience his yeah. audience the gaming audience totally understands it was like perfectly tailored Mm -hmm. and it was because there was a person behind it it wasn't just an rss churn yeah sure i think that's the that's uh reading the statement this this is there's so much going on in it but i think the thing i i can see them feeling possibly if i can speculate a little bit is that this is someone who loved what they did they really enjoyed what they did and they loved that everyone loved that they, that they did mm-hmm. the thing that they did. But feasibly speaking, there was no ecosystem to support them to make money to justify all of the personal sacrifices that they made to do this thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the Patreon was an attempt to say, hey, everyone, I'm I'm doing this for you. And if you want to help out, that'd be that'd be great. And that's kind of where like the the fine line of what an influencer is or a content creator is versus what a brand is, right? Like not to say that Nibel isn't isn't an influencer or, or a content creator, but because the general populace doesn't know them or Wario 64 or whatever it may be, there isn't a personal connection to that person outside of the work that they do. And I think that's kind of where this the Patreon reception and and this statement kind of sits for them, which sucks because, like you said, Ralph, you know, Nibel put so much great work out there, and it's a yeah. shame because if the if, to me, I blame the platform. If Twitter had a way for all of us to monetize safely and, and not in a gross manipulative way, you know, Nibel could still be here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, definitely going to be missed, be... and vacuum is definitely the phrase. There are other people yeah. on the platform mm-hmm. who do what Nibel does, 
Uh, maybe not quite as quite as good. There was just like a something just right about them. Uh, but I think others will pop up, and I don't want to say that to be like, oh, Nibel's replaceable. Definitely, absolutely not. Uh, this is like an Olympus has fallen moment, uh, and you know, I, I hope they come back. Mm. I hope they come, I, I, and as well, I reckon if Nibel comes back now and just says, "Guys, I've heard what you said. I'm going to try and come back, but I, I want to open up my Patreon again, and if you can contribute, I reckon it will be flooded, yeah. dude. I will. I like. I really. Reg- I did not contribute to his Patreon. I took Nibel for granted. That is a fact. I, I did not know, know that that. I, I didn't know. I, I didn't that know that value either. But like, what I didn't, about I didn't know that, that follows, value. You know. Well, again, it's like I didn't know that Naiba was making that value equation in his head. No. You know what I mean? Like I was, I didn't know if he was saying, I need to think about how I'm putting where I'm like putting my time and how I'm allocating it, and yeah. I need to see some return. I'd be like, hundred percent, I need you, Naiba. Here's some money. You know what I mean? Like a hundred percent, I would have done that, and I regret that I didn't. But I didn't know, and so now that I know, I'm like, yeah. If he came back and opened up his shit, I'd be like, yeah, take some cash, dude. Please keep doing what you do. Uh, also, so, uh, just for yeah. uh, creators out there, budding creators out there. Uh, Patreons and uh, viewer funded stuff takes time. Yes, a lot of big creators like thrive off of a big launch. Hey, I'm doing a Patreon. Uh, But the reality is, is that there is for some people a sustainable amount of income that can be generated from that. It just takes a while. You have to Mm. mention it a lot. You have to kind of nurture it. You have to figure it out. Um, So don't be dissuaded uh, from that. It just may, there may have been other factors for Nibel that this didn't work out. Yeah. Sure. You know? For sure, for sure. So in the in well, the absence of Oh, you go on. Yeah. No, go ahead. In the absence of, I was going to pour one out for him. Oh, right. Well, I was going to say just I mean in the absence of that or like in general terms, what do you Yeah, right. Um what are you where do you guys get your news in general terms? Like what is it? What's the like the general r- news hoovering routine for you guys? VGC. Well, VGC. Ooh, okay. Mm-hmm. VGC. Yeah, VGC. VGC. Good. Andy VGC. Robinson, VGC. Um, Interesting. V- Honestly, it's more like I just follow so many games people that whatever is happening sure. just automatically gets surfaced. You know, mm-hmm. it it was Wario sixty four for me until mm-hmm. Wario sixty four told me two weeks ago that my job was gone. So now I have a, I have a bit of a harder, <laughs> yeah. harder relation there. But yeah, VG's it's not his fault. It's Jesus not. It's not. It's not. He fired it's not, you. It's, 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 it's more of an emotional thing than a logical thing. Yeah. I'm not yeah, mad yeah. at Wario sixty four. It's more of a bit. But uh. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 uh, yeah, VGC is where it's at for me. Yeah. All right. Interesting. I mean, it's so cool that you guys don't mention Reddit. Imagine not being on Reddit. I'm so jealous. No, yeah, I mean, nice. I so look great. through Reddit, but it's not like I get my stuff from Twitter. Actually, if I'm telling the truth, we have a breaking news, uh, GameSpot Slack, and that's where everything goes. And so, oh, that's cool. We, we just have like everything that gets, uh, you know, important press releases that come through any emails like pre-writes anything you know goes in there as well as like people just drop tweets like people are just on twitter all the time like it is an integral part of our jobs and especially for the news team because you'll just have like a bunch of developers open and so or you know schreier or vgc and it's like okay someone drops the link in and then everyone kind of gets access to it so on work hours gamespot news slack is where it's at um and then the rest of the time it's like yeah i I value like VGC. I do go on Reddit, but I'm actually not in like that many gaming subreddits just because. No way. Well, just because I'm on, you know, otherwise it'd be games 24 seven. I need that half hour where I'm just looking at um, pimple popping. I don't know. <laughs> You're one of those? Oh no. I am a disgusting human yeah. being. <laughs> <laughs> That's so gross. Actually, no. My oh, favorite man. subreddit is best of Redditor updates because it's usually all the wackiest um stories from like relationships or whatever and then they always get the updates so you find out what happens and so they're always just kind of like oh the follow-up oh i like that cool. yeah but they're also yeah, like 90 nice percent fake anyway but it's just sure, nice to sure, get like sure, sure. a bit of closure interesting yeah right yeah no i mean i have like obviously twitter i have like tweet deck and mm-hmm. like i have certain lists set up for yeah. certain categories of things and I've got obviously like fucking every gaming subreddit and like then I have Feedly set up with RSS mm-hmm. feeds and uh, there's a lot, man. There's a lot that's like, it's just, it's constantly God, being so pumped online. into my ears. I'm so online. It's disgusting. <laughs> uh, it's gross. The only time where I'm not plugged into this is when I'm asleep. And even then, sometimes I'll wake up at 3am and I'll be like, huh? What? Something's Doing happened. that meme like, 
reach for your phone. Those ones, you know? <laughs> oh, no. Um, so <laughs> it's terrible. It's very, very bad habit. Very bad for mental health, I'm sure. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. Just I find Reddit is I find Reddit is the best means of getting it though because it just so much of it gets surfaced at the top. Mm. Like the game subreddit, uh, PC games subreddit is not great. It's like it does its job, but it's got some real trash on there. I'm trying to think what uh, gaming circle jerk is nice for cathartic release. Yeah. I strongly recommend that one. Uh, I'm on that one a lot. Yeah, that's good <laughs> shit, man. Yeah. When I'm like when I've had enough of my day, I'm like, all right, the day's work is done. Let's laugh at some dumb gamer memes. And then I go to game, Gaming Circle Jerk and I'm like, oh, that is pretty funny. Nice Don Cheadle meme. Good job, you know? I think so. there's more power on YouTube specifically mm. uh, for gaming news in some ways that haven't been explored or haven't really totally popped off because that's a hard nut to crack on video. Uh, but I'm curious to see if people try it, especially if Twitter somehow becomes less popular and people are still looking for stuff. Yeah, anything can happen TikTok. at this point. I think TikTok. We don't, I mean, obviously, yeah. we all don't use TikTok, but like TikTok's a thing. Like a lot of people, some people I speak to are like, "Yeah, I get all my gaming news from TikTok. I just browse and stuff pops up." And it's like, "Well, yeah, yeah it makes sense. Really short videos, straight to the yeah. point, just punchy. Like, yeah. hey, PSVR two is here. Here's a here's a picture of it. Here's the stuff. Bye. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah, that that works. I can see that being a thing. Hmm. Well, to be continued. Uh, open open invite to coming on this podcast, mm-hmm. airing out your whatever nibel we'd love to hear from you uh and yes. if you never come back and if for some reason you're listening to this podcast uh be well thanks for mm. the thank memories. you for everything yes i agree now switching gears uh we got a blockbuster interview with matt booty head of microsoft studios we had a really cool conversation with him uh there were certain things we couldn't touch on like the activision blizzard uh, acquisition thing still ongoing uh but this was a lot of fun and we tried to do it a little bit differently uh than a traditional interview we kind of tried a little dvd commentary style uh where we kind of wanted to d- dissect and kind of dive into a little bit of what he said in separate chunks uh definitely would love to hear your feedback on it because we're trying something different so if you're watching this on youtube or uh if you're on the podcast platforms just hit up us on hit us up on social or something if you like this format we were excited about it so Let's roll the Matt Booty interview now. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think the the big question is, how do you, what's your journey to a position like yours? Uh, A long one. (laughs) It seems like a long journey. Um, You know, I was uh, very fortunate to get started in games uh, back in Chicago at a place called Midway Games right out of university. So this uh, actually Xbox is only the second job that I've ever had. Uh, So I started working on uh, arcade games and was very fortunate to work with people like Ed Boon, creator of Mortal Kombat, Eugene Jarvis, creator of Robotron, Mark Turmel, who's working on NBA Jam, NFL Blitz. And uh, it was a really magical time then because the factory where everything was built was the same place where the games were designed and made. So at the end of the day, when you'd go home, you'd walk past this big, long factory row of games that were sitting there being built, being tested. It was just a real reminder that there were these big physical things that we shipped out, you know, that went to arcades and movie theaters and places like that. And, uh, you know, as the industry evolved, uh, took on more responsibility. I, you know, at one point was running all the studios there in Chicago and then head of product development and then came to Xbox uh, around 2010 and worked on a few things, but then jumped right into uh, the acquisition of Mojang with Minecraft and got mm-hmm. to work with that awesome crew for four years, uh, both here in Redmond and over in Stockholm. And then uh, in 2018, I was very privileged and lucky to take on the job that I've got now, which is working with all of our studio heads and creators across uh, Xbox Game Studios. Awesome. So like, what does that actually mean in terms of working with these studios? Because you hear about this like head of Xbox Studios, but what does it mean to manage all of these studios? And what's kind of like a day in the life of Matt? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's two versions of that, the reality and then what I wish it was. (laughs) In my ideal version of a day, I would just spend, you know, all day checking in with the teams, getting to see the game, talking about what they're working on, you know, being able to travel, visit the studios. Uh, And those are 
really the magical times and the magical moments, right? When we get to go visit and, you know, we were just uh, recently down checking in with Double Fine and earlier in the summer down in Southern California with Obsidian and In Exile, um, you know, our studio in Santa Monica. That That is really the fun part and just, uh, the, the you know, the really the core of it. Really what my job comes down to is making sure that our studios have what they need to make great games. So whether that's being the interface to help with budgeting, to help with planning, to help with resourcing. Um, it's really to make sure that when they come to work, that there are as many obstacles removed as possible so that they can just focus on the game. So the more that they, and a studio, the more that studio has got to worry about what's going on back at Xbox or worry about budgeting or planning, it just takes away from working on the game. So my really, you know, my day is, a combination of air traffic control and firefighting to just make sure that they have got everything that they need to go make a great game. I was going to ask, so you, you said you're in this amazing position where you get to see all of these games very early on, all the way from inception through de development. As a as a kind of gamer, what does that feel like? Does it Do you miss the days of just being able to play a finished product or do you love seeing the journey? Well, the thing that I miss is being part of that process, right? So my, um, you know, my passion around games really is around the craft of it. And, you know, I, I got my start in games in audio, doing audio hardware and, you know, audio software and have been involved in a lot of the low level stuff and, you know, uh, really enjoy coding and art. So, you know, if I've got a few hours on the weekend, I'm probably just as likely to be inside Unity or Autodesk as I am playing something, right? Because I just, for me, that's the enjoyment of it. So the thing that I do miss is just being able to be in a studio, not as part of a formal visit, not where everybody's got something together, but just you're just walking the floor and can stop by and talk to somebody about, you know, what they're working on. I think, you know, a big frontier in games right now is, you know, procedural content development, right? Where you, instead of going and making, you know, a hundred trees individually one by one, you're making the parts of a tree and then working with a tool like Houdini say to procedurally generate more trees than you could ever make and being able to, you know, adjust them. You know, the uh, our back to the work that the coalition, our studio in Vancouver is doing in Unreal, you know, they worked really closely with Epic on that matrix demo which is such a great example of procedural generation of a city. And, um, you know, I wish that I could spend more time, <laughs> you know, working on that kind of stuff. I wish you could spend more time talking to the teams about it. Um, and that's that level of detachment from the day-to-day -day process is, is probably the thing that I miss the most. Okay, so we're back in like the post game now. We're, we're back from the interview. If anyone that's listening Out to the Out of the Animus. And, well, that's right. <laughs> and, um, and uh, I really, actually, I was thinking about like, Matt's job is like basically my dream job where I would mm -hmm. get to go around to different studios and being like, yes, this game will get made. Go <laughs> forth and multiply <laughs> the code. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, Just blessing I pieces of code. Any yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but also what he said as well, that back end bit about how he just misses being part of the process. Mm -hmm. And I, in a weird way, like really connect with that mm -hmm. in the sense that like, I don't know i i work very independently personally uh i know it's different for you guys because you have a few more people around you mm -hmm. in your different roles i'm very much just like a solo operator and i think you know i've always wanted to like be able to work as part of a team making a game and i mm -hmm. you know what i mean that's just something i've always wanted to do i know that'll never happen now because i've reached that point in my career where the idea of making a game is impossible but i can I, make I'm a game very... so easily Say again? You can make a game so easily. I've heard it's very easy to make a video game. <laughs> no, as in like, right. you that's, could download... That's what I've heard. You could you download just... Twine. You could write something. You could get... Uh, you could mess around faff about in Unity or Unreal. Dude, I do not have time enough to go that's and true. get like a 20-minute walk every day at the ah. moment. <laughs> the, <laughs> idea, <laughs> the idea of making a video game, holy shit. But... I mean, oh, that is also that, but I think as well, it is that kind of thing where I definitely imagine that at the start of my YouTube journey, like maybe I'll end up working in game dev one day because I do think it's a very romantic notion mm -hmm. of being able to like create stuff. And I'm always very, um, as I said, envious of developers that get to do that. And it's a hard life for them. Don't get me wrong. Like, yeah. I, hundred percent, but, um, but I also hear, I speak to a lot of them and they do speak about that camaraderie and what they create together. Mm -hmm. 
and i don't know i've always wanted to be a part of that but as i says i suspect it'll never happen have you guys ever wanted to like make a game is that the dream you guys want to make games or what yeah, yeah. i've made a yeah? couple oh. small ones wait you have just like written like twine and i made one in uh, is it renpy right. it's the same engine that they made doki doki literature club in because I, mm. I did a I, did, I got i got bored in the pandemic and i did a sure. games writing course because i was like why not no way. Yeah. That's, cool. that's so cool so i've got wow. a couple it's fun. Yeah. Like, honestly, it's just like, you know, we all write a lot and, and host stuff and it's like writing, sure. but like could, approaching writing for a game, like approaching writing something that's, you know, written down and going to be read aloud by someone's voice who's potentially not yours is like a mm. very different concept for me because I always write for myself and I rarely get to tell stories that aren't, here's the story of how this game was made, you know? And so it's kind mm. of nice to just flex a different kind of muscle and then... You kind of get this when you when you work in, I guess, content creation or anything. You know, you get to see the final product at the end. But there is something different about watching something you've made versus playing something you've made. And it is mm. is wild how quickly your brain goes. Oh well, that that bit's not going to work. That path isn't going to work. I need to completely rework this. It's just it's really fun. I wish I had more time to do it. Yeah, mm -hmm. my editor Austin recently started just doing that stuff he sent me like some screenshots of some game he made it's amazing. <laughs> and he's like bro you have to you have to give this one a shout out <laughs> i strongly i strongly recommend this game and i'm like austin it's just a screenshot of a little 2d stick figure you made okay come on now so uh yeah so with him kind of being almost like this like kevin feige of M mcu just like making things happen but like the video game xbox side uh we were kind of curious to see how his wrangling of all these studios ever came together if one studio ever rubbed up against another so uh that was our next one so when you're working all the time with these studios and chatting with them and meeting with them do the studios themselves ever interface in cool ways like have they worked together or shared something that we haven't heard about yeah there's a lot of that um that goes on at, at sort of as you described that horizontal level right there's some of it that just happens naturally. Uh, and then there's some of it that's more coordinated. Uh, the coalition up in Vancouver uh, and Kate Rayner is the, the tech director up there. They really lead a lot of our work with Unreal Engine. So that includes the team working on Perfect Dark, Sea of Thieves. It includes um, you know, up and down uh, the coast there and teams, uh, State of K, our team over at Undead Labs um, working with Unreal. So they really lead the charge there for us in a lot of ways. We have a structure, these things we call summits. There's nothing really innovative about that, but they are led by discipline experts. So we'll have a UI summit, a narrative summit, um, a, you know, a, a networking summit, security summit, um, animation summit. And we'll try to get those run by experts in each of those areas. And they're attended you know, typically by three or four people per studio. And we do about uh, 15 to 20 of them a year and they last a couple days. And that's how they get together to share and talk about what they're working on, share technology, um, bring things, ideas across the studios. One of the limitations of that is that the teams usually unfortunately find out about what people have done which at that point makes it hard to incorporate into the game so a lot of times that becomes planning for you know the next phase of the game or the next game itself so we're doing some work to try to proactively get a little bit more of that information out to everybody but we have got an awful lot of horizontal connections between all the teams uh, around technology sharing, idea design, uh, a lot of things. Are there any examples you can share of like some cross pollination that like you know, that we would know and be like, oh, that thing that you really liked from that game, actually, it came from this other place. Or I mean, anything like that. Well, I, and I don't know that I would point to something that's already out, but I'll just you know give an example. Um, and I mentioned Undead Labs, right? Great studio, but um, you know they're relatively modest sized studio. You know we don't have 300 people working on State of Decay 3, um, but there is a desire. We want that game to compete. We want it to compete visually. You know, one of the things that the team there is really focused on is animation, animation technology. 
um, being able to really up for State of Decay 3, the interactivity between the player and the environment, and some of the things that the coalition is working on for their next project uh, directly applies to that. So there's just been a lot of great sharing. It's cool to be able to go and see an update and see a demo and hear the team say, oh, and here's this code that we got you know, from the coalition and look at how we put it to work. And you're like, wow, that's really cool. And I didn't see that in State of Decay 2. That's pretty cool, right? Another example, even within a studio, um, would be something like Grounded, right? Uh, you know, Grounded, I, I think we're at over 13 million players as of today. We just did the full 1.0 release. Very small team, right, of about 20 people. And how do you get a game done with that small of a team inside Obsidian? Well, you use all the tools that Obsidian has got, all that RPG tooling, all the things that they've put together. You sort of are pulling things off the shelf to be able to go put your own uh, spin and your own idea on it. I think for me, just Grounded is such a great example of how you can create something that's got a cool, unique feel. It's clearly something that stands on its own. It innovates, but it didn't require a lot of technology heavy lift because they were really using stuff that came off the shelf from you know years of work at Obsidian. Mm. All right, so cutting back to our little our little post thing interview, I think that 13 million figure was unannounced previously for Grounded. So uh, that's pretty big for Obsidian. That's huge. That's a lot of people playing that game. That's right. wild. Yeah. Have you guys played it? No. I only played it during the early access period. I don't have time. I'm, I'm the, the exact launch. same way. Played a lot during the yeah. early access. Didn't really touch it ever since. I really want to, of, but I need. I yeah. feel like I, I feel like we always talk about that we don't play games together. Oh, that is so perfect for doing that. I agree Just putting that. that out there. I'm down. But I have heard some reviewers have said like y y it's it's like a hundred hours or so to really get the most out of it. And I'm also like, oh, hundred hours. Do I have a hundred hours right now? I definitely don't have hundred hours right now. Is this a JRPG? <laughs> Fuck God. you, Lucy. Don't you call me out like that, okay? Don't you expose me. <laughs> Literally on Twitter yesterday complaining about Destiny 2 grind for some <laughs> stupid seal. I'm like, it takes too long to earn this triumph. And then, yeah, okay. Thank you for roasting me. I appreciate that. So. You're welcome. Oh, man. I think we should also go back to the whole Undead Labs and State of Decay thing. Uh, you know, the, the fact that the coalition is involved. The, the, essentially, what blew me away the most with this interview was the fact that it seems like the, the coalition, the whole Unreal Engine thing that they've been doing, you know, like they, they provided support in the past. Yeah. Uh, and we knew they did the crazy Matrix demo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was absolutely wild. Uh, but now to hear uh, that they are doling out their assistance elsewhere with something like state of De decay three is pretty crazy considering mm -hmm. the state of decay games are a little more low key uh never yeah. really considered them lookers or anything like that so uh this is definitely interesting yeah Did i you guys mean like state of decay by the way did you guys play state of decay and like it i bounced <laughs> off it i did not like state of decay i don't know why i i hear some people are really all oh, yeah. about it but yeah. i just yeah I, like and they it's like they play for hundreds of hours yep. but i just I really bounced off it super quick. I don't even know why, to be honest. I, I appreciate the ideas that they do. And I'm, I'm actually really curious for this one, especially the fact that like this right here, hearing him talk about it is the first I've heard of the game in a minute. It got that pretty yeah. stylish cinematic trailer back in the day mm -hmm. with like the zombie sure. deer. And then that's, that's, that's really been it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to know that, you know, it's like all hands on deck with this is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Drought, have you played it? No, no. <laughs> I, I, but I, I think it's just because for me personally, I'm a little burnt out on, okay, I've never seen gameplay of State of Decay, but if I had to guess, just throwing it out oh, there. Wow. Oh, here we is, go. Is, here is, we go. It, is, it, is it a zombie game? Yes. No, well, yes. it's actually, no, believe it or not, it is not. <laughs> it's not the as humans. The humans are the real monsters. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, somebody say we are the walking dead. Yeah, that's right. Understood. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's just that that I at the time that they've released those games, I've just been like, I've had enough of zombos and 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 that kind of stuff. And I feel like sure. at this point, if it's not Resident Evil or Dead Rising, rest in peace. All right, uh, uh, I, uh, I I I just don't really get into it. Dead Island Two might be the first game I'm interested in in more recent times, but even at that, I'm. I was not happy with anything Dead Island 1 and Riptide mm -hmm. prior. So I don't know. Dying Light was the same thing for me. I enjoyed playing yeah, right. mm -hmm. Dying Light 1 and 2 for like 
a couple hours and I was like, I think I've had enough. So mm. sure. let's 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 jump over. Speaking of kind of like their more off kilter games, mm. uh, we, we talked about Pentiment with him for a minute, mm. but he said something really interesting about Game Pass. I definitely want to mm. highlight that. So let's go back. Uh, well, speaking of Obsidian, that's a very nice segue into talking about a game like Pentiment, which is very out of the box, um, especially considering just the style of the game, but also kind of the pedigree that's come out of that studio. It's nothing, and it's something which we haven't really seen before. What was the pitch for that game like? Was it an immediate yes from Xbox, or did you all need to take some convincing? Well, um, so there's a few parts to that answer. Uh, you know, first I'll just start by saying, lucky are we that we've got Game Pass, because I think Game Pass creates this opportunity for us to lean in on a game like Pentiment. And the reason for that is, is that we know that when the game goes into Game Pass, it's gonna have a big potential audience. Now, it's still up to us. We gotta build a great game. We gotta make something unique, but wow, like what an opportunity for a smaller team to have access to that. The next thing is that um, I believe in part of one of the principles of our studio system is that when people are making things that they're passionate about, you're gonna get the best game. So we don't um, do a lot of what I call portfolio bingo. You know, we've got this grid. Okay, we've got one of these, one of these. Oh, we need a mascot platformer. Oh, we need, you know, one of these. It's like, it's more, what are people excited to build? And that, um, you know, with, with Josh, I mean, this is, it's kind of the game that he's been waiting his whole life to have the chance to make because it's a topic that's very close to him. It's kind of this weird intersection of an expertise of his from school along with a hobby. So it is, I think, in a way over index on craft and attention to detail because the person designing the game has just got such a passion for it. Now, a little bit to your question. One of the things back to sort of like one of the things that is part of my job is I like to think about a little bit like a, a greenhouse is, you know, Xbox is big. We have these big franchises, things like Halo, you know, Flight Simulator, actually 40th anniversary of Flight Sim coming up. We got Age of Empires, 25th anniversary of Age of Empires. How do you, when you're making a new game, kind of like stand up to that, right? Mm -hmm. And part of my job, I think, is to give those teams a bit of a greenhouse where they can grow in a safe, controlled environment before we sort of turn them loose in the forest, right? And, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that sort of day one, we just say, oh, great, yeah, you know, it's a medieval monastery monk murder mystery, go. But I, we want to give them time to like show us the idea. Okay, great. Like go nurture this thing. Let's grow and see where it goes. And it became clear pretty quickly that um, there was a cool hook there that it was going to build on, again, that Obsidian RPG lineage and would be really unique. So the, it's kind of the combination of those three things that uh, let something like that get off the ground. I guess I would just have one about Game Pass because, I mean, you mentioned before, like, you know, thank God we have Game Pass. It gives you some flex to do some, you know, some weird stuff, put some weird stuff out there that wouldn't otherwise probably be commercially viable in inverted commas. Obviously, Game Pass has its detractors as well, though. People worry about things like game ownership or the way that Game Pass might evolve business model supporting games. What do you say to those sorts of criticisms? What do you what what might you see as the negative, the possible negative sides of something like Game Pass? Well, I think um, really for me, it just comes down to probably the biggest principle that drives Xbox, which is player choice, right? Like we don't we don't see Game Pass as the only choice or the end all be all, right? Like we're still going to sell games. So if owning the game is uh, important and I get it, right? I mean, there's some things that great, we're not gonna, you know, that's gonna be an option for us. We really wanna focus on player choice. So if that's the, you know, and to your point about game ownership, um, just it, we want to make really increase the options that are available to players rather than constrict it. So um, if you know Game Pass isn't either the way that you want to pay for your games or the way you want to own your games, great. We've got other options. On just the business model, um, you know that one. I think we all a big part of the game industry is that we all have uh, a responsibility to keep up with and adapt to the changing business models that are part of a game. You know, the reason I'm just kind of chewing on something mentally here is that, 
you know, as I'm sure you here all know, you know, the business model of a game is so inherently tied to the design of the game, right? You, you know, you can't really take a game that was built for one thing and, oh, we're going to go retrofit this and flip it to free to play, or we're going to go, it's got to be designed in on that, you know, what's your 30 second loop, your three minute loop, your 30 minute loop, those things all matter. So that is an evolving thing that happens on a pretty big time scale. And I think that we are always going to want to follow and pursue what players want, what they see as good options for them, and do it in an additive way, right? I mean, we could sit here and probably go back. I remember um, being part of the team that brought World of Tanks to Xbox for the first time, one of the very first free-to-play games. And, you know, there was a lot of um, questions about how is that going to work because it was the first game in that ecosystem. But we didn't, you know, it's not like we flip over to one business model or another. If you look at what's evolved in terms of bringing free to play to Xbox, bringing a subscription option to Xbox, it's additive, right? So um, I think the the negatives, the you know, potential negatives, I would just look at those and say, great, if, if you're just looking at it as an isolated vertical, but it's always been a big principle of ours that we're going to be additive, we're going to add more choice, and we're always going to start with the player and where they want to be, what they want to do. Awesome. So coming back to the post-interview approach to this, uh, something that I I kind of picked up from, from Matt, and I don't know if you guys did too, but... And it's kind of a, a weird phrase that I'm kind of coming to my mind. It seems like uh, Xbox Game Pass is kind of is in, in the way that it's positioned at Microsoft is not just about getting subscribers, but it's more like financial accessibility. It's really about letting the gambit of anyone out of their customer market pool afford the ability to play games, whether it's mm -hmm. you're buying it on day one to support the developer you love, whether you're waiting for sales whether you're going through Game Pass um, or you're, tr you're trying it out through demos, like it seems like they're really trying to make sure that Game Pass is not just the end-all be-all option, but mm -hmm. it's it's multiple options out of, you know, what theoretically could be financial the financial success for Microsoft. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? If you can add to that at all. I mean, I think that's true. At the same time, they're obviously not doing it out of the kindness of their own hearts because I think some numbers <laughs> leaked recently where, you know, I think they're making like $3 billion a year on Game Pass at the moment. So yeah. they're doing really well. And, and I know it's that Phil also 10 just... 10 to 15% of the overall of revenue for, yeah. so, of gaming revenues for Microsoft. For, uh, it, yeah, Microsoft. it makes a lot of sense, totally. Yeah. Um, but I do think as well, yeah, I agree with that in, in terms of it does make it a lot easier for people to try things and play things. I mean, I my own new show, I shout out stuff on game pass each week yep. and it's an easy sell where i can be like look scorn it's not going to be for everyone most people are going to hate this in fact but hey if you have a game pass subscription yeah. which you probably do if you watch this channel it does make it very easy to experiment and i think that was what that's the thing that i like about game pass mm -hmm. but i know that a lot of people are nervous about it in terms of the long like the long-term impact of it because i think if you look at streaming services it hasn't been a universally good story for music. It hasn't been a universally good story for film. People worry that it will be the same thing for video games. You know, I think in mm. music, um, artists are being paid less depending on how it goes. Uh, I think in the world of movies, there was a really interesting um, hot take. Did you guys see this thing with Matt Damon where he was... It's, it's called hot takes, isn't it? Where the, the, he has to eat the chili. Hot oh. The one where they get... Um, is that hot takes and he eats I chili oh, i don't know what it's called do i don't want i've never hot. sat down and watched it i only watch the clips on twitter and i see people it should be called hot takes okay if people are sitting there eating chili and having to say things then it should be called hot takes okay hot what is it ones. called tell me hot ones, hot ones. And it eats oh i'm sorry okay. that's yeah, so sorry. different thought, to hot takes I thought you're do that's like, so different fucking simpsons where it's like marge where are my chili boots and it's just <laughs> matt damon right. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, we're, on, we're on the same page now. I was a little lost. <laughs> okay. It should be called hot takes, but anyway, yeah. he had this really interesting thing where he talks about the fact that the um, the mm -hmm. streaming platforms have removed the sale of the DVD, right. and the DVD was the huge was a huge driver in the overall um, financing of the movie business. And now it's much harder to make certain movies because. They, the business model has changed so substantially. Mm. The tale um, of uh, selling DVDs uh, after the movie comes out, you know? Exactly, mm. right? And so, you know, that's why he thinks that you, it's just so much harder to get up certain types of movies versus back in the day. 
And I just wonder how that goes with Game Pass in the longer term. You know, mm-hmm. I don't have the answers to that. I don't know. We don't have a crystal ball. Uh, but I can certainly see that becoming a risk if um, mm-hmm. everything moves onto these subscription services. Uh, I can see that becoming <clears throat> a bit of a problem in the longer term. Hearing from Matt, it sounds like they're looking at it as a uh, liberating thing. The Freedom Game Pass brings where he talked about how uh, game design is often tied to the business model. Uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting because when I when I hear that, it's like, oh, okay, maybe it's less games that feel like they need to rely on some other alternative monetization within mm-hmm. it or mm-hmm. just like overextending itself to really get bang for the player's buck. Uh, my big concern really with Game Pass is uh, per- like not perception, but like, you know, the, the, the what's the word? The relevancy, the zeitgeist of it. Like when a game releases, you don't want it to disappear on a service with a bunch of other stuff and mm. you know mm. it obviously it can happen with small games and like even with scorn where i was like i think scorn's kind of cool and weird a bunch of people in my comments were like up oh, another game dumped on game pass that's not that yeah, great yeah that's true and i'm that's like true. man i don't know i think that stuff is good like experimental stuff like that yeah. should have a, a place to exist i think my concern is like i hope it doesn't get to a point where we could see bigger crazier experiences where microsoft is able to take this tons of money and invest in this incredible thing that goes on game pass but unfortunately because of it the way it's plopped on that service it gets forgotten about quick like i just think of i could to compare it to streaming services i can't yeah. stop thinking about the the russo brothers film the gray man the gray man with, oh, yes. yeah. with um with like with, who's in it i don't even know is, it is that ryan Pine? gosling is that is it Oh, Chris that, Evans, Chris Ryan Chris? Gosling. Chris yeah, Evans has a mustache. Was... Um, the, the fact that that movie was like a billion, jillion dollars to make, and it seemed like it would be a big deal, but it just kind of showed up on the service, and that's it. Mm. And a lot yeah. of people forgot about it. I just don't yeah. want to see games end up in that situation. I don't think... That's a really good point. I, yeah, mm. I think that's a really great point. I also think, like the Netflix comparison can be a bit like it can work and it also can't because Netflix like never releases figures or, you know, Netflix's version of like how, how much a movie has been watched or, or like how, however many yeah. people have watched a movie is kind of weird the way that they measure it. Yeah. The thing with Game Pass is like, yes, if you are an Xbox first party or now I guess Bethesda too, like you release onto the service typically day one. But like Matt said, there is the option to buy it. Like you can always buy I, stuff as well, but I think you for can now. for now. But you can also buy stuff. You know, some stuff will go on Game Pass, and then it'll usually always go on PC. It'll come to PlayStation yeah. later or yeah. something. So there is that. I think this is a broader discussion about just the loss of physical media, which is you know, I don't necessarily think Xbox is going to go the uh, fucking Warner Brothers Discovery route of writing things off for tax reasons. Um, yeah. But I also think, you know, in the video game space, there are people who are so just like conservation is front of mind. Yeah. And that's, you know, emulation and all that kind of stuff is another it's a it's a complicated thing. But ultimately, sure. I think the Game Pass is a net positive because I wouldn't have played, you know, like Nobody Saves the World, for example. I had a great time playing that. I just found what it on game. game Pass. Amazing game. Yeah. Amazing game. Like, Plague Tale is how I, I got that on Game Pass the first time, I think. And then Requiem yeah. launched on there. And so if it's giving a boost, and also if it helps games like Pentiment get made, like could you imagine yeah. anyone actually saying, oh yeah, we'll make Pentiment. Like this weird game about sure. like the Middle Ages. Yeah. So next up, of course, like we had to ask Matt about Halo since, uh, you know, for a lot of people, it's not doing so well. Definitely might be a touchy subject for Microsoft, but uh, he dove into it with us. And also uh, we asked about Perfect Dark. So let's kick that off. So obviously Halo Infinite is having a rough run. It hasn't quite landed in the way that or it landed well, I think. But it's since then, it's really struggled quite a bit. So what is Microsoft or yourself put that down to? And what is the general approach for the next little while to get that back on track? Yeah, well, you put it well, right? I mean, in December, uh, I think we had a peak of around 20 million players playing the game. And just kudos to the team for building and shipping a game during some pretty challenging times, right? Like last year, still in the midst of the pandemic, still everybody trying to figure out how to adapt to remote work and hybrid work, which I think if there is a 
worst case condition for trying to get games done there. It is the big multi hundred person team trying to final a game, right? And um, they you know just that went smack into that. So kudos on shipping it. As um, is apparent, you know these days with a game like Halo Infinite. Shipping the game is just the beginning. There's got to be a plan for content sustain. There's got to be a plan for regular continuing engagement. And we just fell short on the plan on that. So we have really uh, retrenched. Um, we have got some changes in how the team is set up. We've got some changes in leadership. Um, and we've just got to really get refocused around that sustained content plan and making sure that we're bringing a regular update of content for the players. And, you know, just thank you to the players for sticking with us through this, right? I mean, we know that there is, you know, way more demand and there's so much more we could be delivering. Uh, appreciate the players sticking with us. And that is our focus right now is on quality of life for the game and getting on a regular cadence of uh, content, getting back to that. And it was, uh, I think, you know, you put it well, it was a little bit of good finish across the finish line and then sort of the classic runner's mistake of kind of tripping and stumbling as you come across the finish line. And we've got to recover there. So, you know, the burden is on us. The team's very focused on that right now. And it's a reflection of a thing. I think something that's very different today than, you know, five or 10 years ago uh, in the industry of just uh, that that arc of production really has to focus on what is that plan after you put the game out in the market? Because there's really, you know, the phrase of like gone gold or we shipped the game. I don't really know that that has as much meaning today as it did, uh, you know, five or six years ago. Hmm. Can you give us any update on Perfect Dark? There had been reports about uh, leadership changes, uh, Crystal Dynamics involvement. Uh, can you confirm that any of this is the case or, or give us anything really? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll kind of break that one into two parts. First, I guess in my mind, it hasn't been so much leadership changes as it has been building a studio. So, you know, I talked about, I think one of the most difficult things of the last few years has been finaling a big game on the scale of a Halo or a Battlefield or something during the conditions that we've had. Number two has got to be trying to start up a new studio. <laughs> um, you know, you don't have the shared history. You don't have people that have worked together for five and 10 years. You're, uh, we were doing a lot of experimenting with remote and hybrid and how we could attract talent. And some of it worked, some of it didn't. So it's been less leadership changes and more just the, the work of building a studio, right? It's a brand new studio. Uh, we were very fortunate to be able to partner with Crystal Dynamics and bring the expertise that they've got. And, you know, the relationship that we've got is we have a full team in our studio, the initiative in Santa Monica, and Crystal Dynamics has got a full team. And it is what I would call co-development. You know, it's not outsourcing. It's not like we're hiring them to work on maps or hiring them to go make art assets. You know, they are an equal partner in the development. And I think that as we chart a path forward for what post-pandemic, post-hybrid work, you know, game production starts to look like, that that's going to be more and more the norm. You know, if we think about successful projects, we've had Flight Simulator for us, you know, built in tight partnership with Asobo, which is over in France, but we've also got a full team in Redmond. Um, something like Minecraft uh, Dungeons or even the upcoming Minecraft Legends, which we were really excited to just show off this past weekend, you know, that is made in partnership with BBI. Um, you know, that is partnership between a Redmond studio and a studio in Stockholm. Even something like Age of Empires 4, we built in partnership with Relic, which is up in Vancouver. But again, we've also got a full team here in Redmond. So, you know, it's not a case of Crystal Dynamics has taken over or, you know, they're replacing. It's more that, look, we had a hundred and some people become available who have this great pedigree of working on Tomb Raider, um, people that we know whom we've worked with. They're available. They're excited about working on Perfect Dark. I mean, you know, they're not going to sign up to work in this way for something that they're not excited about. So to me, it's really more a part of how you build a game team these days as opposed to, um, you know, some sign that we are trying to compensate for something. It's really just I think we're going to see more and more of what I'll call tight co-development uh, going forward. All right, so we're back post game now. Uh, I mean, I actually appreciate that Matt was pretty upfront with Halo, and he's like, "Yeah, we have 
retrenched people and mm-hmm. we've made changes to leadership and we're you know it's he wasn't like saying actually halo is excellent and we're really happy with it and we just had like he was like yeah it hasn't hit the mark and so i appreciated that that was cool yeah. i mean you could have definitely gone another way in that conversation mm-hmm. um and i mean yeah like it's it's a bummer that halo is where it is I mean, obviously, we've talked it to death over the last little while. I think everyone's talked about why mm-hmm. why Halo is where it is. I guess we're just waiting now for those changes to sort of take effect. Mm-hmm. Um, it is encouraging to say that uh, to see that he started talking about like how Microsoft is going to be more focused on that live service delivery model when they drop stuff. Clearly, this was like a big a big learning point for them. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully, they're able to kind of like change that in the future for other stuff. But it is obviously a bit of a bummer that it happened the way that it did and yeah. that that learning hadn't happened earlier for a play, like a franchise as as pivotal as halo yeah, yeah like what what happened to cortana like why didn't they no i'm kidding but uh, <laughs> really you know no in all seriousness i think um th- it was a good way like he's good at answering questions especially as somebody in leadership yeah. i i you know obviously you have to be careful with what you say but like i get like he's he can acknowledge that there are issues without like shitting on the team that made it you know, a bunch of people yeah, did work sure. on that. Um, I yeah. I do think it sounds realistic and hopeful. And I mean, yeah. l- especially him acknowledging that going forward, uh, they feel like this whole post thing is going to have to be a part of the dis- design discussion from the beginning is, is good, mm. especially hearing that from somebody who's overseeing a bunch of studios. Mm. Yeah. And we'll say, I mean, you know, don't go loose. Sorry, sorry. I was gonna say, like everyone, I think everyone was so ready for Halo to be good again. Like I remember just the outpouring of positivity when Infinite launched and people just got back into it. That was a great month. Mm, yeah. And then it just totally. kind of fell off. And I think people are kind of ready for that again, or I hope that they are, because I mean that multiplayer is good, man. It feels so yeah. good, and I just want more new stuff. I want, I give me reasons to play more of it. You know. Okay, so for this part, uh, we just kind of got a bunch of fishing questions. We tried to ask whatever we could, uh, get whatever we can out of about uh, you know games we're excited for and stuff. Not too much commentary for that, other than just to roll it. I'm obligated to ask about Fable. I'm the Fable fanboy <laughs> here. Uh, so with Playground Games working on the new one, they make racing games. How did that work out? Did they pitch you? Like, what was the general thought process there? Yeah, so Playground does make racing games, but if we deconstruct that a little bit, uh, I think the thing that Playground does is high craft, high quality, high attention to detail. And so I'll separate that out as kind of a starting ingredient. They had a particular passion for the IP, and I think they also demonstrated that they understand what the heart and soul of Fable is about and how they can bring it forward for sort of today's sensibilities and just, you know, make a modern take on Fable. Uh, you know, I, I, there's there's stuff that I wish I could share and show because there's some of the just the, you know, the things that I've seen are just so encouraging. And um, your point is really spot on, right? That you don't, there's a danger sometimes that you don't want to give, you know, the RPG team to go make a racing game or vice versa. You don't want the shooter team to go try to make a kid's building block game. I mean, you can get in trouble there, uh, but they've got a great technology base. They've got a passion for the IP and they've just got such a demonstrated commitment to craft and quality. You put all that together and then, and admittedly, I think the team would share that during some of the first reviews, I shared a little skepticism, you know, that look, that I, th- I feel like we're kind of going out on a limb here to do this, but they've since put that to rest. And uh, I'm excited for everybody to see it uh, when we are ready to show stuff. Yeah. I remember I played uh, Wasteland 3, and that was the first time I'd played a Wasteland game. It was the first time I think I played anything from In Exile. And I was like, hang on a second, this is like really super good. And it feels like that studio is actually kind of really underappreciated and unrecognized because I certainly, I wasn't paying attention to them, right? So they're working on something different now at the moment, yeah? Yeah. Could you share yeah. any information about what that is? And or at or can you tell us like, do you think that's going to be the one that actually people really go, ah, oh, here they are. Now I've noticed this studio. Because even then, I don't think Wasteland even hit that, you know? Yeah, well, and Wasteland was great. Um, 
So I'm not going to steal the team's thunder by you know talking too much about what they're making because I want them to have their moment where they get to reveal that. But I'll say that in the last, call it six months or so, of the, the times when I've gone to see a demo and the team is kind of showing us something new, uh, going to get the demo on what they're working on and the vertical slice of what they got was a really cool moment because um, it just it was actually a moment where we had all the studio heads together we were reviewing it and everybody was kind of blown away it was one of those things where they showed us <laughs> they started showing us what they were working on or a couple minutes in and i'm like oh this isn't bad for what they've got and then it went a few more minutes and you're like oh they got a lot to show here and then i'm like okay we are 15 minutes into this demo and this still looks fantastic and then they're like, okay, so now let us show you the next part, right? So the um, just what they've got done is great. I, If there was some measure for a studio of the coolness of what you've created as a ratio to how many people are working on it, that studio has to win some kind of prize because they just get the absolute most out of everybody and make the most focused use of the resources that they've got. You know, Brian Fargo leading that studio, it's just a master class in these are the resources I've got. These are the constraints I've got. This is how big I am. Okay, what's the best thing I can do with that? So I love what you said about could this be the one that puts in exile on the map? I think they are a little under the radar. Um, but uh, we were just down there to visit right after uh, E3 back in June. We stopped by there and uh, continue to be excited about what they're working on. So that's another one that I'm, again, I don't want to steal the team's thunder. We'll let them reveal it. But it'll be, I think people will be uh, excited when they see what they're working on. So Starfield, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, <laughs> and I think generally the reception to that has been positive for sure. People are excited. I think a lot of uh, some other people are like, oh, it's just kind of like Skyrim in space, right? Do you think it's Skyrim in space? If it's not Skyrim in space, like what do you think really sets it apart? Like where where are you seeing that 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 really evolves that Bethesda Game Studios model? Well, just knowing. Uh, having had the chance over the last uh, year and a half or so to spend more time with Todd Howard and you know, and uh, see how he works and see what he brings to game design, you know, I'm confident that he's not going to sit still on what was built before, right? This isn't, uh, it just it's not his approach to come in and kind of reskin something, right? So there's going to be an awful lot of things that move forward uh, with this game, you know, just from my view, a little bit from the outside looking in, in the case of Bethesda. Uh, the things that excite me first are just the visual style, which, um, you know, for lack of something better, I would call this kind of NASA punk. You know, it's very inspired by the concept art of the late 70s, early 80s. So it has a little bit of a sort of retro cassette kind of feel to it, which is pretty unique, pretty cool. Um, and just the things that it brings into the game, which almost given the genre, you are just you have to have it'd be almost one of those how could you not put that in there so you know the ship building the space combat the world exploration i think there's going to be an awful lot of new stuff that uh bethesda fans and todd howard fans have not seen brought to the game and you know that uh, i know just uh from checking in with them a bit the team is you know hard at work to uh to get that thing all buttoned up and put together i'm fortunate enough to be involved in a lot of the status reports and things and it's just fun watching them kind of iterate through that level of polish on the game right now the release date can you you got the release that you can share with us now is that <laughs> sure it's not gonna be like 3 Try 3 20 it's not 3 3 23 right todd loves that shit he's all about it so just confirm it here and now please the 3 3 23 that no no 4 4 24 um, okay all right yeah <laughs> that's what we can rule out that okay. at least so that's, that's good. good that's something uh, and just like a final quick one to finish, uh, you've got a lot of uh, games coming out over the next 12 or so months and beyond. If you had to pick one from the Xbox portfolio uh, that you're most excited about personally, what would it be and why? Well, see, this is this is the tough part of my job. Is I, You can't ask me to pick a favorite kid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who's your favorite sorry. child? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll just say, um, I'll say a little bit about all of them. First, you know, this past weekend we got some gameplay on Minecraft Legends, and I just, um, I, I, there's so much uh, thought that I know that that team puts into making everything authentic to Minecraft. I think it's very, really cool. Uh, Forza Motorsport, 
uh, that's another one where I wish I could just, you know, if they were hiring, maybe I could go take a role on that team. <laughs> I'd love to be part of it. Um, just what we're going to see, I think, is going to blow people away. Very excited about that. Um, you know, we've got cool stuff going into Game Pass right now, things like Scorn and The Plague's Tale. Um, I was just uh, reading today some early stuff around uh, the new thing from Fat Shark and Warhammer, um, the Dark Tide, I think it is, which is pretty cool. You know, we've got these anniversary editions of Age and Flight coming up. And then we've obviously got Redfall from um, Arcane. And then, uh, you know, as we start to look down the road on the calendar, obviously Starfield coming up. So it's just an awful lot of stuff uh, coming out here as we head uh, on the other side of holiday. And I think there's things about all of them to get excited about. Awesome. Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks thank for you. having me. It's been a great conversation. Thanks. Cheers. So there we have it. I think the first thing we kind of want to wrap up with is uh, how do you guys at home listening uh, feel about this structure? Because, you know, it's like sometimes we get somebody on the show where it's like they just hang out and they just talk and shoot the shit with us. But then sometimes we have, you know, more high pro profile people like this where their time is limited. So we tried this whole like DVD commentary <laughs> style post game interview. <laughs> Would love to know what you guys think about that. I will yeah. say, though, I can't get anybody to tell me anything about Fable off the record or on the record. Oh. I'm trying so hard. I want to be the number one Fable influencer on YouTube. Oh, and it's just not okay. it's just not working. There we go. So All we're right. going to have to keep trying. We're going to have to get someone else on. You need to Play set up a new. Hit you up, man. Yeah, the, you need to set up a new like Twitter account, like the Fable Insider. No, it'll be at Chicken Chaser. <laughs> <laughs> Chase chickens. All right, next up, now some good old fashioned video game talk. Uh, first, the major game releases uh, from when you guys are listening, either a little before, a little after. Bunch of stuff. Mountain Blade Two Bannerlord is releasing on the consoles on the twenty fifth. Victoria Three on PC on the twenty fifth. What is that? Sounds like something That's I'd like. That's one of those, uh, uh, I don't know, do you like grand strategy games where you have to conquer Europe by through mercantile and <laughs> threats of military action without actually any military action? Is that your, is that your jam? As a British Sometimes. person, I couldn't comment. Do, do you like lots of <laughs> spreadsheets and tables? No. <laughs> okay, well, then Victoria <laughs> 3 is not for you. Is it? We <laughs> also have uh, Sackboy. Uh, Sackboy, is it Sackboy, A Big Adventure? Mm hmm yes PC. that's the yeah, pc release on the 27th mm. apparently that's I, I, kind of bombed yeah i saw <laughs> you guys heard i haven't i haven't watched it yet but i did see digital foundry um i think they released a video called like stutter boy or something so maybe it also like Ooh. doesn't run very well stutter yeah, boy that's so disrespectful that. to him what was that what <laughs> his they said oh yeah the hash no no hang on sack boy a big adventure pc the hashtag stutter struggle is real that was it Oof. not stutter boy wow. Also, it peaked at 610 concurrent players yeah. on Steam, so it did not sell very well. I uh, thought that game did really well with kids on yeah, console. It did. Sure. Um, that's just the only, like, anytime I'd hear anybody in real life mention it, it was that. Um, so I can't picture, like, a, a 10 year old with, like, a Steam account and, like, <laughs> RGB lighting being like, fuck yeah, dude, I'm going to download this day <laughs> one. <laughs> it is such a cool image. <laughs> Backwards cap. <laughs> what a what a rad ten year old. Fucking legend. He's got a big future ahead of him in content creation. <laughs> or, or getting banned from platforms. <laughs> <laughs> Next oh, up we have Star Ocean, the div uh, the Divine Force, uh for everything except Switch on the twenty seventh. We also have Bayonetta three on Switch on the twenty eighth. Mm -hmm. That is something. Uh this is we'll October, by the way. October mm. for these dates, because yes. Bayonetta 3 is already yeah. out. So Yes, thank you. Uh, Resident Evil Village, the Winter's Expansion, on everything except Switch on mm. October 28th. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 uh, on all the major platforms on October 28th. Reverse. Resident Evil Reverse also dropped. I didn't know that. Maybe I was too oh, busy yeah. buying I the other did stuff. I did not know is that it, was out. Is it officially <laughs> out? Because it yep. got... It and got it, and it, <laughs> It officially sucks as well. <laughs> it oh, officially no. sucks. It's like oh. it's like forty percent um, like mixed on Steam, and one review outlet like Rely on Horror gave it one out of ten. They reviewed oh. it. They were like the only outlet that bothered to review yeah, it because no one else could didn't. be fucked. <laughs> Everyone's just like this sucks. Oh, uh, it's, it's Resident Evil multiplayer peaked thing. with Outbreak. Unbelievable. There was a zombie elephant. That's all we need. <laughs> Um, all right, we also have the chant on all major platforms besides Switch on November 3rd. 
the Entropy Center mm. on all the major platforms other than Switch on the 3rd. WRC Generations, which also stands for World Rally Championship on the 3rd. From Space on PC and Switch on the 4th. Harvestella on PC and Switch on the 4th. And Soulstone Survivors on PC on the 7th. What, what is that one? That is essentially imagine vampire survivors. Oh no. But I'm instead in. of yep, instead of vampires and basically Castlevania, it's kind of more, you know, sort like wizardry and magic. Oh no. Sort of I, that that angle. I didn't need to hear and, that. And and instead of being the 2D top-down thing, it's actually a slightly isometric 3D look. Like it's it's oh. 3D graphics, right? Uh so it's cool actually. I'm, I played I'm it during the next up fest. Steam. Yeah, I, I played it during the next fest. I liked it. I think I played quite a few of those um, Survivor clones, and most of them don't really do much. They're just kind of like, "Hey, it's the same game. Buy it again if you yeah. like." We've mixed. We've got some slightly different visuals, I guess. But this one has a very different visual look. It is in three D. It has very different sets of powers, like an upgrades that really do play quite differently from Vampire Survivors. Um, I don't quite love the perspective in the terms. I think it's a I think Vampire Survivor is so clear. You can really yeah. see it. Even when it's just a complete clusterfuck. <laughs> totally. You can still see what's going on versus versus this one. I was finding it a little bit visual, visually noisy. But of all of the Survivor clones that I've played, this is the only one where I'm like, okay, this is an actual video game. Mm. There's something here. This is this is interesting. You okay. know what I mean? So, um, Is there a Vampire well, I, Survivors I'm, style game where you have guns and sunglasses? I'd like to play that. Probably. I mean, at this point, there are so many oh, of those so clones many. that probably, yes. Probably. What's the okay, other one? Cool. Um, oh, what is it called? Like, Hello. to dawn? Something to dawn. Hmm? 20 minutes till dawn? Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah. The yeah, that's a fun yep. one. Yep. I like that one. I haven't played that one. I haven't played yeah, that that's one. good. Uh, the other one that's missing from this list, actually, is Signalis, which I thought was Signalis, ah. but it's apparently yeah. Signalis. And uh, that apparently is excellent. It's a like a PS1 style survival horror game. Um, all the reviews are super positive. Yeah. I think I've seen some 10 out of 10s Ooh. around for that one, like that high. Um, but it's definitely one of the better indie titles of the year. And if you're into your classic PS1 era survival horror, then every yeah. chance that you're going to love that. I so didn't realize I'm, that's I'm what actually, it was. Holy shit. Mm. I think it's and I played, I played the demo. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Game Pass, you're right, actually. Totally forgot, yep. I played the demo in the next fest, and it was one of the best things I played in the next fest. Just immediately sucks you in with its vibe. It controls beautifully. Mm. It looks fantastic. Uh, I think this is... Well, I mean, I haven't played it, but the reviews certainly say it's all it's all that. So, yeah, man, that's mm. another one to put mm. on your list. Again. I do want to add to the list real quick, just before everyone forgets, Vampire Survivors is coming to Xbox and yes. Xbox Game Pass. <laughs> yes, true. You have no reason yeah. to... To ignore this game now, I believe it's coming out on the 10th of November, right yep. around the corner. Yep. Um, number one Vampire Survivors podcast right here, friends per second. Yep. <laughs> yes, we will shill it's for the vampire, $2 video vampire, game. Just <laughs> saying. Vampires just per second. Just saying. Just saying. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's a stacked last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. uh, and we've been playing a lot. So I think I want to kick it off with Gerard. You've been playing Resident Evil, specifically the Winters DLC. Uh, what did I, you focus on? Did you focus on Rose? Uh, I played the Rose, the Rose portion. I did not get a chance to play the Ethan Winters over the shoulder third person mm. one. I just did the Rose DLC. Um, the Rose DLC was nice. It was a fun time. I think it uh, it fills in some of the gaps between the relationship of 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 Ethan Winters and the. The people that he kind of encountered um, throughout the experience of of uh, village, it you do go to the same places as as you do in in um, uh, village, but the enemy types are different. It's not just the same, you know, uh, werewolves and and that kind of stuff. Um, and and the the and the villain is pseudo the the merchant from village. He's kind of the overarching right, villain throughout the experience. Um, and yeah, you know, it's 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 a fun way to kind of put a button on the winter's tail. It, it does feel like we get a little bit of closure. Uh, we we do get a little bit of of uh, father daughter generational bonding. I don't know how to say it. There's just Ghost like bonding. you know, they're bonding in general. Yeah, because because yeah. you know, uh, 
I think she's 16 in the game, 17, and she's lived her whole life without her father. So, like, this is, like, her going back to her roots of, like, oh, you know, maybe... It, the whole bit is that she wants to get rid of her powers. She thinks she's cursed and just wants to not have them anymore because she's a monster. And so, kind of throughout this journey, she learns to love herself and love the powers and love that relationship that she had. So, it's, it's really it was really fun. Mm -hmm. Um gameplay it, the gameplay is jarring i will say because it, it is that over the over the shoulder third person perspective we're used to uh it doesn't feel as snappy i feel as it should have with with um uh re2 remake or re3 remake or it's a little soon off. to be R can't it's explain a, it's, it it's a little off it it, it feels like it feels like they they didn't just copy and paste the the way that the camera and the engine behaved it just kind of felt like, all right, let's move the camera back, move it onto the shoulder, and then get rid of the FPS mechanics, and it's fine. Right. Um, interesting. So it's a little, a little weird. I, I don't know, Jake. Did you feel that way too? It's just like it just feels kind of slow sometimes as you're aiming and shooting. Yeah, it feels slightly off. I think it still like was competent. I also spent yeah. some time with just the regular old village mode in third person and they actually gave him some like animations oh. uh, like now sometimes when you solve a puzzle i'm just so used to resident evil games like when you add a key to a door it just goes there it is mm -hmm. now they'll show him sometimes actually do something to a puzzle uh little things like that uh transition stuff was a little awkward even environment size sometimes felt either way bigger or way more claustrophobic than it there's, did yes there's a lot of moments where like uh she'll go down the ladder in a corridor that was first person. And then you get to the bottom of the ladder and the camera is just right up against her hoodie <laughs> oh, and yeah. you can't see anything else because right. that's how it was designed. Cause you're going sure. first person the whole time. You know what caught me yeah. off guard that the Rose experience and no spoilers or anything, but it actually had some genuinely like spooky moments. Mm. It had some good oh, yeah. tension here and there. I like that. Yeah, and, and it, it did follow the through line of, like, the first game is... The first one is, like, it's in the castle with Lady Dimitrescu, and the second's a little bit like the dollhouse, but both elements well, are cool. very different, very, very different from each other, which is nice. It was a creative use of, like... I, I assume that they didn't have a ton of time um, or they didn't have a ton of resources because it is pretty short, uh, but it was a good How use short? of is a lot like of that Is it, three hours or what? It's yeah, about th three hours, three, three, three to four three hours. Ca casual, casual hours. Yeah, it's okay. pretty, pretty short. Cool. My question for you, man, is uh, I don't I don't know how to frame this, but like, do you do you feel like it was worth it? Like the and I'm not spoiling, but like when it ended, I was like, OK, all right. Like I, I was glad there was like some closure and some and they've officially said like we knew this from the beginning. They were like, this is going to wrap up the winter story. And I was kind of like left with like that was fine but like was there plans for more was there a hard pivot some somewhere did something get lost in translation in covid development like what because i just felt unfulfilled by this whole winter's exploration you know from from the course of the games like i, I just didn't know what they were doing with it correct me if i'm wrong but i believe that they were not planning to do any dlc for village and that when they announced the DLC, it was because Village sold so many copies. Like, I think they just kind of were like, oh. we're going to set it and forget it. And then when they saw the smashing success of Village, they said, oh, we should probably do some DLC. And that's why we're only getting one pack that has everything in it. Whereas with, with, with RE7, there was like four or five wow. packs. And yeah. and they were scattered throughout every every few months or, or a year or so. So by the time you... We're done with 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 RE Seven Village, uh, RE Seven Gold. We had a whole robust, almost second game ready to go in the in the base of the game. Whereas mm. with this, they were very much like, and th this is all it's going to be. It's going to be the third person Ethan mode, Rose's DLC, and you can play as the the four lords, which I think is pretty cool. That's actually really rad. Um, but I and I I I watched that I, after I played it. I went back and I watched that that playstation or the resident evil direct or whatever it was called about village and i think they said that they, they wanted to go with with her with rose because it was kind of like subverting the expectations of what people could expect from from village um and i kind of agree they did that but i i don't know 
if it worked 100%. I don't know if the landing was necessary because mm -hmm. we don't know Rose at all. We've had two games with, with Ethan Winters. We barely even know Ethan as a character. We don't there's even know. To know. There's yeah. nothing to know. There's nothing, he, there's he, nothing is, to he just know. likes to explain what he's doing. <laughs> right. And, and, he got and get a little his, cool and get his hand bitten one. He did get a little cool. And sometimes you're boring and then you're a little bit cool. Mm -hmm. well, I think that's pretty deep. This, this, but by the end of Village, <laughs> right, it's very much established that, like, this is a man who clearly loves his daughter. That's, yes. like, that's and the takeaway you... And you felt that. And so with, with Rose, they did the 180 of making it about her and her father the whole time, which is nice, but we still don't know who her father was, despite how many hours we've played with them. We still don't really care about their relationship all too much outside of the fact that, oh, this is a woman who doesn't have a father. Like... Which is a very relatable thing for sure, but there the it's almost like the Resident Evil, uh, you know, horror aspect and and the fact that it's in the village and the, and the castle Demetresque, none of that mattered for for the essence of this story, right? Like the the not not the Las Plagas, but the mold mm. didn't really mm -hmm. it wasn't in my opinion wasn't the defining factor for the Ethan Winter story. The Jack Baker stuff was so much more interesting. Oh yeah. Uh, regardless of the mold or or sure, or sure. um you know the what's her name Evie or I think Evie or Ava the the the, the girl who's a, who's the granddaughter or oh, is the grandma oh, yeah. the whole like, um, catalyst for it yeah. Yeah, like that was so much more interesting. It was self-contained. It was great. Village kind of was like and this they didn't really connect in my opinion all that well. So when it's like this is the end of the Ethan Winter story, it's like well is it that doesn't really mean anything to me. It the Ethan yeah. Winters saga. Yeah, well, it's it, like yeah. it's interesting because it like DLC plans, uh, where you said initially maybe there wasn't plans for DLC. Uh, the fact that the game ended with like seeing Rose and teasing whatever the next thing could be was that going to be a whole game or something? Because I was incredibly excited and interesting because I was like, that is a weird direction, mm. and we just jumped ahead in the whole Resident Evil timeline. Like we're now so far from everything what's that going to be like? And then it really ultimately amounted to just this like humble experience, not a bad experience, but like it didn't even wrap up being like, and actually Rose was working for umbrella all along. Like that's what I want. <laughs> yeah. That's why I don't write the games, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm still interested to play it because I, I, I liked the seven DLC um, a lot. And I know what you had, the way you described it, it's very different clearly, but um, and I actually wasn't a huge fan of 8. Like, I respected what it was, but I didn't really connect with it because it was so different from 7. I was really into that kind of, like, like you know, that swampy horror from 7, you know? Um, but I just think it's... I want to see the story through. I really do believe that Ethan Winters is probably the worst video game protagonist I've ever had control of, but I still have to see a story out, especially if it's, like, a three-hour conclusion, man. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, we've been enough... To, we've been through enough together... For him to, for me to owe him three hours. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I may as well good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, next up, Lucy, you've been playing Potionomics? Yeah. What, what is that? It's a Lucy game. It's a Lucy sure. game. <laughs> no, <laughs> so time, Lucy game. Uh, Jordan Ramey on the GameSpot team was on the podcast uh, last week and was singing its praises. It is a management sim similar to the start of Stardew Valley. You know, you're... In Stardew, your grandfather's left you a little farm in this one. Your uncle has gone to a mysterious island where there was a witch uh, that people defeated. And then he opened up a potion shop there. Uh, then he dies under mysterious circumstances. And you find out he's taken out an incredibly ambitious loan to buy this potion shop. And that because you are his heir, it falls to you now. So you basically it's actually Resident <laughs> Evil Nine. Yeah. <laughs> so you basically have to run a potion shop, and that means you know making sure there's stock, um, mixing up potions, selling them. But the selling is is actually a card battle game, mini game. Wow. And so it's really cool. And so on top of that, there is social sim stuff where there's different people who come in, different friends that you make. You also have like a talking owl friend. <laughs> um, and then you can send, you know, one of your friends is an, ex an adventurer, for example. So you can send them out to go and get rare um, or more uh, items for you that you then make into potions. So there's all these kind of nice little gameplay loops. 
Uh, I think it's really well written as well. It's not voiced, but the writing's really funny. Um, even that opening thing where it's uh, your uncle just saying how much he's moving to this island, how much he loves it. And the final letter is, if you're reading this, I'm dead. You know, it's like, it really <laughs> leads into that. Um, there was one character that I ran into, Baptiste, who does like the Jojo pose of like, doing all this. And like, as someone who's watching Jojo's Bizarre Adventure for the first time, did very much appreciate that. Um, but yeah, you can you can befriend people. Um, so it you can hit on your customers, right? When they come in, that's customers. part of the card game. Yeah, hitting on your customers. Can hit on your right. customers. Nice. And uh, no, it's just a really fun one. I'm playing it on Steam Deck, and I uh, it's just. I mean, the biggest complaint I've heard about it so far is that people just wish there was an endless mode. So in order to pay back the loan, you kind of get in. You enter into like these competitions. So you have you know every few days or so there'll be one of these big competitions and that's kind of like the benchmark for progress and uh, people really want there to be a a free roam kind of version mm. free play at the end and uh, i really hope they add that in it's a lot of fun it's just very chill so that's my lucy ass game for this episode i saw i'm the... definitely intrigued just as a card battler yeah uh for selling yeah. stuff well, because selling it... stuff in games is either always just click click mm-hmm. click sell all or like a haggle system, but like, yeah. how do, is this like the main flow? Is that a main portion of the game or? So your day is is split up into uh, obviously times, time of day. Uh, and so in between kind of like the, the downtime, I guess, when you're not in the shop, you can go brew potions. You get a different bonus based on how you display your potions. You can go talk to everyone. When you're in the shop itself, that is all the card system. And it's really fun. So instead of health, they have patience and you know the more turns you do the more card so you can play these cards where you basically like your opening card could be um your your opening pitch which would raise their interest and the more they're interested the more they'll pay but it will decrease their patience and so you basically have to find this nice balance of getting them more interested so you get more money because at the end of the day you do have a loan to repay but also not wearing down their patience and also it's really it's got some really nice messaging in there because your character doesn't lose health, they get stressed. And so <laughs> there are some bits where, you know, your little owl friend will be like, Hey, if things get too much for you, why not go hang out with a friend? That'll ease your stress. Or why don't you just call it an early oh. night if you're stressed? And it's like That's nice. It's just really nice and it's, you know, just a a, a nice way to gamify um mm. taking care of yourself and stepping back every so often. So it's very it's very fun. I'm enjoying it a lot. I saw the team it. behind it is uh, like the former AAA developers because the presentation factor on this is huge. Oh, yeah. like, the way you're describing it, you imagine most of these little like nope. p- like potion games or you imagine something looks very simple, like pixel art almost. And this is not. This is like really, it's 3D, a really good looking 3D game. models and animations on all the main characters. Uh, yeah. Like everyone is yeah, so it's... full of personality. It's great. Yeah, it really does look like they really know what they were doing like clearly this is an experienced team to be able to produce something that looks that nice is like yeah cool very very, very well done chill. it's also a so dating me. sim kind of right yeah yeah, yeah. you can you can pick your face you can give gifts you can hit on people yeah okay it's really ticking all Speaking the boxes of dating this. simulators uh bayonetta three oh you've been spending a lot of time with that sure sure do you recommend uh, no i Oh, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really, really, really enjoyed it. I'm not a massive character action or spectacle fighter fan, as they call it. Uh, but I like these games, always have. Um, I've really always enjoyed Bayonetta games. Um, and this one's no exception. Uh, have any of you guys had a chance to play it yet? Not yet. Nope. Have you guys played the other Bayonetta games? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Are you Hell into yes. them? Yes. Are you a bit like, eh? I'm, yeah, terrib- yeah. I'm terrible at them, but I just love how sure. camp they are. I love how over yes. the top they are. I... It's yeah, I, I love them so much. They just know exactly what they are. They're a lot of fun. They just really lean into it. Mm-hmm. It is utter ridiculousness the whole way through. Uh, yeah, it's just this. It's this very. It's this very choreographed sort sort of uh, spectacle, uh, but also deep enough that it's very playable. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the the combat systems on display are always industry leading. This is no exception. Uh, biggest change here is that they basically have added kind of like kaiju to the game where at any point in time you are fighting with your normal like combos and you press one of the triggers and it will summon a big ass demon onto the battlefield and so long as you continue to hold that button you're now in control of that demon you are not controlling bayonetta she's literally naked off to the side
outside, like dancing away, doing her thing. I was going to say, is it her you hair? Are, it's a, well, it's all connected to her hair, but yes, ultimately. And uh, and now she now you're controlling this demon, and this demon has like combos, and you move it around the battlefield, and you beat up dudes or whatever, and they have like all these special abilities, and that is it. So it's really cool, and there are like a lot of these demons, by the way. I think there's eight in the game in total, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's wild. It's it's very wild. It's a little bit messy. Mm. It's a little bit scrappy at times because the camera issues that this creates not great yeah. and also the depth of that demon combat is nowhere near as deep as is controlling Bayonetta herself mm-hmm. but it's fun you know and if you don't want to have to summon those demons you don't have to because you can just still beat on enemies with you know Bayonetta herself that works fine um but yeah overall I think it's great it runs pretty well on the switch like quite well actually i would say but it looks like shit it really does like uh, the switch is old and bayonetta is such a perfect showcase for why nintendo needs to update their hardware because platinum have had to squeeze all of that system's power into performance as in making this game run smooth and they've done a good job of that and character models look good enemies look good but and the action is smooth but the environments look terrible like they're so bad it's just it honestly it can look like a nintendo 64 game at times i know that's brutal but like yeah it actually does it looks really bad i'm maybe not 64 okay maybe gamecube let's say gamecube okay but it looks shit like if you really take stop and look at these environments you're like "Mm, this is no this is a problem you know so uh that's a shame because obviously platinum are such visionaries they have so much imagination mm. they could deliver so many incredible environments if they had the hardware headroom to do that um and so that really does i think let that title down it's the very first game i've ever reviewed that while i was reviewing it i was like i can't wait for this to get a remaster <laughs> you know what i mean like <laughs> oh, a new release game that's coming out yeah. that's came out this week i'm like i really hope it gets a remaster because you, you just feel so constrained mm. by that hardware you know so um i yeah I- it's I'm I'm with you, Ralph. I just know for a fact that they're not going to remaster this thing. And if they do remaster, it'll be on the next whatever Nintendo console it is. Because Nintendo funded Bayonetta 2 and Bayonetta 3. Yep. And, yep. They're, and they're very, very, very anti-PC. Oh, no. It's never going to come to PC. Of course, never, Nintendo just never. don't rock that way. So, yeah. But, you know, maybe in the next console generation... They do a remaster of it and they touch up the environments. I doubt it though. Platinum are not... Platinum have enough... I don't think they have the luxury of being able to go back and remaster their old titles at this point. Yeah. They've, yeah. they've got some challenges they need to force through and going back and remastering their old stuff is not how, what's going to grow that studio and get it on its feet. It's, it's a bit rocky. Yeah. Um, but hey, What's the deal with the other characters? Because when they yeah. started talking about that, I was like, wait, I just want to play as Bayonetta. Like, is that stuff sure. compelling enough? Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's a little side mode with uh, Jean, who's another one of the Umbral Witches, and she has a like a fun little 2D side-scroller stealth game oh. where it's kind of, imagine a grid-based format where she's moving through kind of like an office building or a, or a scientific complex, and she moves from space to space trying to stealth up behind enemies. And it's hard to describe, but it's a very clever little, I would say, mini game. Sounds uh, like Suda 51 stuff. Sure, sure, mm. sure, sure. Um, and then the other one is Viola, who is a new character and she is, yeah, she's her own person. She's, she wields a sword as opposed to anything else. She only has that one combat style as opposed to, you know, Bayonetta who has lots of different weapons. Viola is just the sword. Um, she's not as fun to play as Bayonetta, but she's a nice change of pace because you can only play her on certain, um, on certain areas. She's cool. Great personality. I really like the voice actress for uh, Viola. Her name's like Brizzy Voices. Who is in God of Work? I, really? Wow. Okay. <laughs> she plays. She plays Elizabeth uh, from Human. Re- or not Elizabeth. Yeah, she plays Elizabeth. She's the main character in God of Work. Oh my okay, god. Okay. Right. There you go. That's amazing. She is super talented. I saw her years ago. She has this video where she does. This like cartoon rap or something. So imagine that there's like every letter of the alphabet, someone's written this kind of like this little sentence and all the words start with A and then all the words start with B for the next sentence. And then she will do it one time in the voice of a Powerpuff Girl. And in the next sentence, she immediately switches to the voice of Jessica Rabbit and whatever. It yeah, is it's the remarkable. Al- al- alphabet re- yeah. uh, 
aerobics rap. That's right. And it yeah. has 27 million views on Damn. YouTube. And like, I must be a couple of a hundred of those views because I just keep watching it just being like, how do you do this? It's incredible. <laughs> um, and yeah, so amazingly talented and really nails it in this role as um, Viola. So yeah, it's um, it's cool. Look, look, if you don't like Bayonetta, you're not going to like this. Mm. If you like Bayonetta games, you're going to like this. But I do think that really hardcore character action uh, fans may be a little mixed on it because I think it's additions aren't that purest combat focused stuff it's more about spectacle it's more about like hey look at the giant kaiju battling in the streets of tokyo or whatever yeah that's it's not, not what about... i go to that series for <laughs> yeah if that's the <laughs> case Definitely then i not. think i think you'll find then that you probably won't love these additions as much mm-hmm. like yeah you should probably stick with something like devil may cry or whatever so yeah mm-hmm. but, yeah right. interesting interesting game despite all the dramas with old mate helena taylor <laughs> It just oh, keeps yeah. getting from bad to worse. But I think that story is finished now, surely. Yes. Let's hope it is anyway. Yeah, one. shut the book on that. Uh, <laughs> Lucy, just real quick, what's the deal with Marvel Snap? You put in the notes, they oh, finally got man. me. Everybody's talking about this game. I don't really pay attention to mobile games. What is this? Oh, they finally got me. <laughs> Every one of my... Fu- like, and I, I've said on this podcast on all my other stuff that I'm pretty much done with Marvel. Like, I haven't enjoyed the last (laughs) couple of movies. I'm feeling that fatigue. What about Quantumania? What about Black Panther 2? Mm. What about um, uh, Spider-Man Goes to Home Again? The movies. No, I... (laughs) Honestly, I, Doctor Strange was the real tipping point for me. I was just like, I don't think. Oh, I'm the really. best one. <laughs> oh, there's that take. Yeah. See, that's yeah. so interesting. That is, it is that kind of movie. It's like I stepped out of it with a friend, and he's like, "That is the best Marvel movie I've ever seen." And I'm like, "I really did not like that. I don't think that was good." Sounds about right. So I, I, yeah, I, I've got I've got people in my corner here, but no, I I was just kind of like I kind of want to break. Um, I'm also more of a Batman. He's dead, but I'm more of a bat fan. Um, and so everyone in my feed was tweeting about it, like the usual suspects. Greg Miller was tweeting about it, and like I know, I know how much Greg loves Marvel stuff, and I was just like, I'm gonna ignore him. But then everyone else started, and then everyone else, no, I'm kidding. Everyone else started tweeting about it, and I was like, oh, okay, God, all right. Downloaded it. It's made by Ben Brode and like the Hearthstone, you know, a lot of folks who worked on Hearthstone. Oh, I see where this is and going. And then it came back <laughs> to me that I did have kind of a crippling Hearthstone addiction when that game first came out. <laughs> to the point where we played it in the office so much that UK IT cut off access to Battle.net and we had to be like, no, I'm afraid you have to turn that back on because we do generally need it for work. <laughs> we're sorry we're playing this game so much. It's just really good. And um, yeah, it's a card battler six turns there are three location cards in the middle and each location has um a different uh, impact it'll have so you know some places will be like okay your no no card can be played here on the fifth turn or if you have more cards here you get double the power and then it's up to you to position your marvel heroes or and villains and whatever into these three different locations and um each card has a power attached to it uh, and a cost and so it's up to you to manage the amount of power that you have um, and place all, you, all your guys on the on the board and, and win. And it's really good. And when you level up, you unlock more cards. The more you use cards, they you can change how they look. So it really also gets to the collector in you as well. Uh-oh. And then you it's deck building. Um, and I'm first. I've heard the monetization isn't ass. I, I haven't at one- looked at it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't at need one to. point, the monetization was us. And yes. I, as I remember the narrative around this mm-hmm. game where it was revealed, and everyone's like, this is sick. Yeah. And then they made some changes to monetization. There's like, whoa, they fucked this. Yeah. And then they spun it around. And now everyone's like, yo, this is like the best monetization out there. Well done. You know, yeah. it's like, it's been a ride. As far as, far as I this, can tell, like- the monetization is like, there is a regular, I think there's a free battle pass and there's a battle pass you can pay for. Um, and then most of the monetization is beyond that battle pass is paying for like, gold or whatever and then that you can use that to upgrade your cards i i think like i said i have not delved into it too deeply you're collecting oh. and stuff is this like is this like real marvel like can like the punisher talk to ant-man or is this like only mcu type stuff um i don't know it's it's all marvel no it's full it's, it's full, full marvel, marvel. Yeah, the punisher is actually cool. an amazing card early on so anyway um <laughs> but yeah no, no it's all marvel and then there are different um 
like cards, uh, like versions of them. So if when you level them up, you can get like different looks for them and different card backs and everything. And so it is really. <sighs> It's also quite cool because like there are some there are some characters in there that I don't actually even know, um, and they kind of do a really good job at looking at the Marvel roster beyond just who's made it big in the MCU. Um, and as an X Men fan, I really appreciate that. It's good to see him in there. Um, so yeah, it's a great. It's really good. It's coming to PC as well. So you know, they're just trying to. It's already on PC. Oh, is it? Is it out? It's, like, it's on. It's on Steam. Yeah, it's been out for a bit actually. It's been out for maybe two weeks actually. I would say. I didn't yeah. need to know so, that. Uh-oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, it's it's re- it's really good, and it's like I think the next I think the thing they're working on is like I don't think you can play against your friends just yet. I want to oh, say okay. I think That's it's just kind of like all random. I might be mistaken on that one, but like, um, it's it's really fun. It's it's a good game. It's annoyingly good. I did good. play it. I did play it at the start, and I was like, yeah, this is cool. I like mm-hmm. it. But also, I feel like because I played so much Hearthstone, and I was playing card games before that as well. Mm. Um, I forget the name of what I played, but I played for a long time actually. And whatever, um, it's just nothing about Snap really said to me I should, I must continue playing more of this. I think I must have put, I don't know, let's say two to three hours mm. into it, right, over different days. But I think because that card thing was so played out in my head mm. i just it just didn't click for me so i'm gonna try again though because everyone is all about mm. it at the moment and it'd be fun to be in on that while everyone's enjoying it yeah. you know but um i'm a follower yeah. not a leader so i'm downloading it right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> i can see what he's got his phone no that's it's right. it's just something that's, that's right. like you know if i'm in between meetings and i'm like oh i've just got you know it's it's quick it's not as uh much of a time investment and so you know the num- yeah. the numbers are going up, and that's what I like to see. I don't always win, but when I do, it does feel good. I I genuinely I feel like um, God Dennis from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. When sometimes I'll just see someone play something, I'm like, ha, 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 you stupid bitch! <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, it's great. It's genuinely Have like you played it, Gerard? Have you played it? I do not like card games. Okay. I, they're just not for me. I've tried sure. Hearthstone. I've tried Gwent. I've tried. I just. I just can't connect with them. Uh, and I'm not the biggest Marvel guy in that way that right. everyone else mm-hmm. is. So I'm. Uh, I. I'm happy that everyone else is happy and obsessed with it. I'm glad that it's not too crazy on the monetization side for people to. Yeah. They can just enjoy the game. Uh, I just. I. I feel like. Vampire Survivors is the only game for me that's going to keep me crack. coming back. So that's <laughs> why I, I don't need. Please. I don't need multiple. <laughs> I don't need multiple addictive problems. Okay, that's Vampire true. Survivors is more than enough, and I blame you for that, Lucy. So thank you. I blame um, uh, Jake for that, I and blame, I and I blame uh, Tam. Uh, Tam for that as well. So, so Tam, Tam, so, the OG Survivor yeah. influencer. Our our our. Uh, our 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 our, tr- our troll goblin on this show, <laughs> our fighting game yeah, goblin, our, our yeah. fighting game yeah. goblin. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I I'm I I I do like watching people play it because I, I like seeing high level play, and I I've been there's some folks who've been streaming it. It's been really interesting to watch. Yeah, hmm, cool. Yeah, I'm gonna look into that. Uh, well, last but certainly not least, God of War Ragnarok is upon us pretty much uh we've been playing <laughs> review copies of the game we're gonna be talking Gerard's about it spoiler free sorry gerard gerard did not get his hands on it so. taking his head yeah. off but, uh, he can't he doesn't want to listen this is going no. to be spoiler free this I'm is gonna here. be totally i'm here you know spoiler free don't worry about it keep yeah. it safe don't worry yep totally uh, spoiler free by the way because some reviews that i've read are like quite spoiler free but there's still some stuff in there that they spoil and I think this one is going to be like a hundred percent spoiler free. We're gonna we're gonna play it real close to the chest. I would recommend going in blind. I would also recommend, like, be careful on YouTube because oh, people are gonna I put shit in from the first game from the God of War twenty eighteen. Rather, I had the Blades of Chaos spoiled for me in a thumbnail, and that killed like a really cool moment. The moment's still great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but that surprise would have been so what did so you do good for audio. Logs? I remember that surprise. That was incredible because yeah. obviously I re- was reviewing the game before it was out, and I think that was one of the most fucking hype moments yeah. that I've ever experienced in a video game. Where I was like, I can't believe how much they nailed this. You know, so we so we did it, that for yeah. audio logs that moment. And I, someone was like, we have to put Blades of Chaos on that. And I was like, mm-mm. So we ended up going with how God of War's most impactful moment almost didn't happen. Okay. So that's okay. that's the workaround. That's good, that could mean anything. Could mean anything. Yeah. Yep. 
But yeah, that's true. That's a nice one. I, I was like just that. like, that's shit, lovely. did we spoil that? No, we didn't. We're good. I will say that Ragnarok is filled with cool moments like mm. that. Can't talk about any of them. Don't want to ruin <laughs> it for anybody. But uh, the game is uh, immense. Massive. It's enormous. I don't even mean in size. I just mean in like the feel of it all, mm. everything about it. Uh, I'm still very, I'm fresh off of it, like just wrapped it up. So like I am workshopping this in my head right now, but like it feels like a bigger, better sequel in the way that, uh, okay, stay with me here. Like uh, The Matrix Reloaded, uh, where, uh. The, well, okay, listen, Whoa. like the start of The Matrix Reloaded, the first fight. It's oh, okay. very confident, yeah. very cool. Clearly, everything is elevated from like choreography to special effects. The music is crazier. Like, everything's like, holy shit, sequel. And Keanu Reeves is like, upgrades. <laughs> like, this feels very much like that type of thing. Like, when you see the sequel to a movie or a game and it's, it goes 10 times harder. It even reminded Terminator me a lot of two. the original God of War 2. Oh, Terminator. That is so, Terminator 2 as well. That is so interesting because I actually feel totally the opposite way. <laughs> I, when I, what I said in my review was that I actually don't think you should conceive of this as a sequel. Mm. I feel like this is part two of a two-part saga, right? And it's like Kill Bill 2 is not the sequel to Kill Bill, like volume two is not the sequel yeah, to Kill Bill yeah, volume yeah, yeah. one. Do you know what I mean? It is a yeah. continuation. <laughs> and I, I agree. And I, and I, and I actually absolutely agree that the spectacle is bigger the the combat is better the blah, video gaminess is bigger the video yeah, gaminess is better but i don't actually feel i don't walk away from this and think that was a great sequel i think of it as that was a great conclusion to this saga because i know a lot of people are going to be like oh how different is it from the last one and i think the answer is not that different it's kind of very similar and i think that in terms of setting people's expectations i think going into it at, with that volume 2 mindset is a better way to approach it and appreciate it rather than the I'm expecting the jump from Terminator 1 to Terminator 2 because it's not that like it's mm. definitely not it's definitely not that yeah. no I would definitely push back on that mm. so that's my personal take no no I think I, I agree I think it'll I, I wish that I'd played God of War 2018 just before playing this and just experienced the whole thing as like one big adventure kind of thing I wish I'd done that because I feel like not that the emotional moments aren't hitting because they absolutely are, but just to have the you know part one of the story so fresh in the memory would have been really, really great. Um, but yeah, it does feel like a continuation in many ways. Like you, as soon as you start the game, you you pick up your weapons and you're like, oh, I, I, I'm going straight into this. Like I know exactly where I am. I know exactly what I'm doing. The stakes are higher and like you, it, it definitely pushes you towards um, and through that story really, really well. But also it like references the first game a lot. So yeah, it does big time. And I, and I think, I actually think the, and I've, cause I've rolled credits, uh, FYI, uh, 37 hours is mm. what I spent for my playthrough. That was a very meandering playthrough. I did pretty much every bit of side content I could do until I kept getting pushed back onto the main path because there are certain parts of the open worlds that are locked down and that you can't talk of, that you can't access until you have to come back later, right? But as I was playing, I really just did all the side content, mm. 37 hours to roll credits. Um, I would say that... Um, the biggest accomplishment of this is I actually think it makes God of War 2018 better mm. because I think that's the, the power of a good ending is it makes the, the preceding journey more valuable, you know? And I think that this nailed, and I know like you guys are at different stages of completion on it, but I think it nailed it so spectacularly well that immediately I was like, I have to go back and play 2018 again, mm. you know? And you contrast that to something like Game of Thrones where because they've, fucked the ending so hard yeah. no one talks about game of thrones anymore mm. it's just like it's been erased from the popular consciousness who wants to go back and watch game of thrones now you don't because you're like it ends so badly and it feels like the whole saga of game of thrones is undermined because of that ending mm. even though those opening seasons were magnificent of course mm. but just it's just it's lost that currency and i think that what ragnarok does is it kind of like wraps it all up in bubble wrap for eternity you know it's always going to be good to play god of war one and two you know because you are going to be guaranteed an amazing time you know it starts strongly and it finishes just as strongly and i think that is so so incredible mm. 
It also right. does something that, it, like, I, I was concerned uh, that it would not be as uh, reserved as the first one in terms of, like, either just going crazier, like, referencing old God of War stuff or... Mm. I, I think it's still very much, despite it being, to me, like a, a bigger, bomb, more bombastic adventure with more characters, uh, still managed to not hit weird things like that were too echoey to old God of War stuff. I, I don't know where I was trying to go with that that whole point. but No, I know exactly uh, what know you, what you mean, mean, actually. Right? I'm totally with you. Totally with you on that. There's yeah, a couple there's, of things um, that they explored that I did think... I liked were was more vague mm -hmm. in God of War 2018. It's so hard to talk about that without spoiling. Um, <laughs> yes, but I are think, you talking about the old series of games? Are you talking about the you're talking about like the original God of War games? Uh, so yeah, so for it's 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 so hard without spoiling. <laughs> it so is hard. Essentially, it is hard. There's like there's a couple of things that this story did that harkened back to and expanded upon 2018 things that I thought was a little a little too much. Like I didn't need. Mm -hmm. personally still rounded things out pretty good but i was like i, I didn't need that to be touched upon and then yeah. i also still respect it for being as reserved as 2018 was in terms of not beating you over the head with all this kratos mm. stuff from sure. his past because that's true i like i look at these games and i'm like oh man if i was making god of war like it would be so cool if like what if uh you know what if zeus showed up again like they, <laughs> they have the creativity to actually want to commit to telling a new thing and yes. i respect that yeah yeah totally totally how did you find the combat this time around did you feel it was very different the same like were you happy with it like how do you feel about that in general uh it's still really good mm -hmm. um yeah. I, I like how it was it was structured the same as the last one where like the challenge is there, but like the challenge is really there if you want to go out and find it. Yeah. Uh, but I did find myself kind of relying on a lot of the same moves, a lot of the hold same no tricks. One. Yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah, love that. Hold on one. Does the I'm, job. I'm about the hold R2, the charge. Mm, yeah. Yep. yeah. That one. I'm, I'm big on that one. And the backward dodge where he like boomerang throws the, the yep. axe. Like I was unlocking and I'm like, oh yeah, this one. Oh yeah, that one. Okay, cool. And then I got into sure. my like loop again yeah. uh but i think it's ju it's just enough to to shake it up yeah I think the additions in there like uh from new moves and whatever are like a fun i definitely because you can now you know do that thing where you sort of chart like imbue your axe and yep. the blades with like uh more elemental stuff and i was finding myself like forgetting to do that and then i would kind of build it up and i'd be like oh no wait i can do this and i can can let off a bunch of frost and like get rid of these guys and you know the thing the thing that gets me is that like i think the combat is great i really enjoy it feels crunchy feels good i'm getting to the point where the story is picking up so much that i'm like mm. not mad or resentful that i have to do like some combat <laughs> but i'm like oh i just want to see where this sure. is going but i, I mean i think yeah. as well and, I, and that kind of falls to the like maybe my one bugbear with it is I don't want to spend time in those menus, man. I don't want to spend time talking to like upgrading equipment and stuff. I I get why it's there. It's great to unlock new stuff and kind of do the mix and match, but I just find that it takes me out. Like I I don't necessarily want to have to do it um, because mm. but that but that's purely because the rest of it is so good. Um, performances are I mean to be expected they are fantastic mm. like. I totally. some of the moments in there there's like one character who I'm not gonna say who it is or what the context is but they let out this scream and I was like oh my god okay how did you get that recorded let alone you know like yeah. get the whole motion capture and performance capture stuff done yeah. um very very moving it's it's just phenomenal the ways that they explore that father-son relationship and like mm not just within the kind of context of Kratos and Atreus talking to each other, but like how the relationship is perceived upon by other characters and how others comment on it and how mm. um, it's all part of this, this wider thing. And it's like, I'm, I'm not finished yet, but so far it is like an absolute triumph that it's like, it's going as well as it is. Like it's so Oh good. yeah. And it gets so much better as you, as you get towards the end. Mm. I, I think one of the things that impressed me so much about it was how it dangles that prophecy of Ragnarok and how it uses it as this 
Mm. Oh man, it's so hard to describe it without describing it, but it, it is such a confounding ride where you just you have this knowledge of this thing because the Ragnarok is a is a mythological story that we're all familiar with, mm. right? And it has all these events and milestones and relics and things that happen. And this and Santa Monica know that you know that, mm. and they're fucking with you all the time based on your own knowledge. It's like they yes. know how to just mess you up based upon what you assume might be something, but then all of a sudden it's the other thing. And it's just, again, can't describe it, but a truly masterful manipulation of that of that prophecy. Mm. And, uh, and the way they use it as a jumping off point for their own story is just amazing. And I think that's so, that's what's so clever about this. That's why like God of War 2018... I didn't feel the need to replay it immediately because that was a very emotional story that was kind of like, oh shit, I got hit in the feels, but I can't have that again because mm. I know what that is. But this, I found I found this plot to be so clever that I want to go back and play it again so that I can like pick it apart and like notice the little things mm. and oh that, you know what I mean? It's just, it's that level of intricacy that makes this there's plot. There's a lot. There's a lot, it's you know, it just, it's so worth experiencing again because of how elaborately it has been built and how well it has been executed and that i think is the is the is the power of this plot so um of this story you know what i mean mm. I, I loved it gerard you, you know i like how something. you know and i, I say oh, how i like I how just it does wish I, could, I wish i could contribute <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. soon man soon yeah. soon you'll have the chance <laughs> yeah we'll do a follow-up definitely mm -hmm. the one, the one thing i do like take, yeah. is is that uh as as much as I like that it's doing its own thing, it's telling its own story, I still like how it does have the little elements of DNA that made the very original God of War game special. Yes. Uh, specifically with the disdain, not really disdain, but the, the just the approach to gods themselves. Mm. How they are portrayed, how they are perceived, how they perceive each other, how these relationships, which are documented in myths and lore, are actually played out in front of you. Mm. Uh, just feels really fresh, and I feel like you don't see that in any other type of, you know, video game or movie or show, really. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, I think as well. Sorry, Lucy, go. No, you know, you go on. I was going to say that the the rendering of these gods as we as they are here is so because obviously we've all just watched the MCU for the last ten or fifteen years or whatever it is, and we've all read Thor comics before then, and I don't know, maybe we've read some books or whatever, but you know the way that these characters have been portrayed mm. here it's such a unique take on these gods it's so worth watching you know yeah. it really is just such a thought-provoking cool interesting spin without feeling like they just threw it away for no reason like oh we're gonna make this character totally different because we feel like it yeah. but they're still called that same god name it's not like that mm. it's it's grounded in a deeper reading of those characters a different interpretation of their sort of core tenets uh, and yeah, just so, so, such a facet. The writing team, man. Imagine being that good at writing yeah. stuff. Imagine. Yeah. It fuck, really fuck, freaking worked for yeah. me. I, fuck I think, people. too, with how it's structured, I think for me, a lot of it, like how it worked was how it's almost like you get, for all the supporting characters, you get like, you know, decent uh, character development, uh, but then you can essentially get more through the side quests. Yes. Yes. And it feels, you know, there's plenty of games where it's like, do their loyalty mission. Uh, but something about how the way it works here, uh, maybe it's just how organic, like how you can just kind of flow into a side mission mm -hmm. and barely even realize it. Yep. Yes. Uh, just makes it feel like the story is that much more elevated. And I mm. think it's definitely one of those games where structurally and story-wise, because it's so intertwined, it's like absolutely one you should savor and slowly pick your way through it and do all the side quests. Basically, like if you did that with the first, with God of War 2018, expect to do that again tenfold. And it's, mm. m I think, more rewarding. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. For sure. Yep. I think, I think the open world design is a real, that's probably the biggest improvement in terms of. It's massive. From, from the last game. Yeah. From the last game to this one, that's the most noticeable uplift mm. in terms of the gameplay design is that there are more open worlds, there are more to do with them doing them and they are massive yeah. and uh i was just yeah they were they were all really fantastic that was a that was a they, big they do a so really good job of like uh, it's like staggering every mm. every time you yes. stumble upon a new one you'd be like oh my god i have all i have all of this now but yes. it, it's so easy to just kind of like 
you like dip your toe into one mm -hmm. and then you find a treasure chest and then you turn a corner and you're like, oh, I'll go do all this. And then you just kind of stumble into that again. Just the way, again, the way it flows mm -hmm. is really, really good. But interestingly, it's that idea of like saving the player from themselves because if you just opened up all of this, these open world areas immediately, as soon as they arrive, the player will probably just do them all. Yeah. And then they'll probably get bored and they'll be like, oh, this is too much. So what they've very smartly done is they give you a little bit of the open world and then they say, you can do this part, but then you need an upgrade to get to the next part. So yeah. fuck off, <laughs> go and do some story and then come back when you've got this thing. And that forces the player to go, okay, now I'm going to go have some some time with you know on the main missions with yeah. Kratos and Atreus. And that is so smart, I think. I really think a lot of games could could learn from that. It's, it's okay to have big open worlds, uh, but the way you might partition them to ease the player into them, I think that has resulted in me enjoying these worlds so much more because I'm sort of being led by Sony or by Santa Monica to mm. these spaces rather than just feeling like, well, it's all there. I should just tick every box while I'm here. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And that would be terrible. So yes, no. well, well very, said. Very well. Yeah. No. Yeah. So um, yeah, man, God of War Ragnarok. It's great. Yeah. They did it. Can I, can I say? Can I say they did it? Like they did it. I just. Everyone was angsty about this. Are they going to pull this off? I 100% believe they pulled it off. I'm sure some people are going to be like, eh, it's not that good. Some people are going to be like, ah, oh, the other one was better. But I think personally that they absolutely nailed it. I It was everything I had hoped for from this follow-up, this concluding chapter. And um, just truly in awe of this team and, and what they've been able to produce yeah. with this for sure. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, re I really think that for people, for story people, I think you're going to be happy. I think for gameplay people, uh, for the people that hunted down all the Valkyries in the last game and like uh, faced that challenge and got the platinum and did all that, you have like, you have way more of that here. Like yeah. you have yep. so, so the game basically like the, the design document was basically like, oh, we saw the data of all you guys who killed all the Valkyries that were optional. Well, <laughs> here you go. Here you go. Uh, a friend <laughs> and, of mine already great. has the platinum says it's quite a nice one to get if that is your kind of thing there are like a bunch of collectibles and stuff in there but he says the the platinum's very very nice to get so i think i will i never I think I, games. I think i, I will too i firmly i firmly believe that platinuming ruins most video games i really really believe well we got to unpack this on a later yeah no i 100 percent believe no you're on a podcast not, with uh, with the completionist himself that's right. watch your goddamn but, mouth. Be, but <laughs> because of the way that platinum <laughs> trophies are constructed they don't actually ask you to have fun with the game. They ask you to do tedious things with the game. And so the pursuit of them is often like ruinous to your enjoyment of those games, but right? And God of War Ragnarok but, has made you a believer. No, but like, yeah, but no, but like Spider-Man, for example, or, or whatever. It's just like, just play the game mm. and do a little bit of extra shit. And then you get the platinum. And it's like, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a great idea. That sounds like fun. I'll do that. This has that same vibe mm -hmm. where you look at it and you're like, yeah, I can do that because I've already done most of it as I played. I'll do a little bit after that. And then boom, nice shiny trophy. Yeah. That is how it should be. It blows my mind that it's not like that for every video game. It's craziness. And that's what I think. That's my hot take on um, completionists stuff. Complete Mr. Completionist. Ralph. <laughs> Yes, you, here we you, go. You get a gold star because I agree one hundred percent. Yes, I think Hell I yeah. think I think trophies are reverse engineered nowadays to make people keep playing their games because they don't necessarily have the developer may not have thought about everything they want the player to see. Right, There's a lot of trophies out there that are just bloat, 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 bloat to get you to keep playing their game, but. Or you could just let the player fondly remember their completion experience and yes. recommend that completion experience because of that. Oh, and that's why radical think, radical design thinking right here. It's, <laughs> let players have fun. <laughs> Whoa. Well, look, it, it feels good to, to check off the boxes to get the trophy. Mm. Sure. But when you're like, this game has 100 plus trophies dead by daylight. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you just let people enjoy the game. Mm -hmm. But Dead by Daylight Dead fans, they love that, mm -hmm. that like, micro hit of, like, oh, man, if I just kill, if I get a 1,000 kills and rank every killer up and do all this stuff, I'm just going to get platinums and, and yeah. whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it's like, just just go, just shave it. Make it yeah. fun. Make let everyone enjoy the game. Just And not to segue or too awkwardly, but it's a conversation being had in the Destiny community right now where, you know, Destiny has these... <laughs> Jake, every time, I, every time I mention Destiny, this is Jake. 
<laughs> every time <laughs> go back and rec- if you're watching video go back and watch jake's face when i said that okay i'm not making it up you should see i've had enough of this dude but in the destiny <laughs> thing everyone told me about this because they have these triumphs or whatever these these like seasonal events and you have to get a seal for the seasonal event like you do all the events mm-hmm. within the seasonal event you get a seal the seasonal event is fine but the way bungie make you play it is fucking garbage you by the end of the event you hate it you hate this event by the time you are done with it and it's like was this your goal Bungie? was that it you know and so i know we've really gotten off topic here but, but um the point of all this is to say that playing through and completing god of war is a very pleasant experience so especially yeah. because uh they they fixed my i should have led with this my biggest complaint of the last game was the fact that you just kill those trolls endlessly and like that's oh, yeah. the oh, yeah. big enemy type here there's a bunch of stuff to kill yep there really did is. you see oh, i don't want to say because it's a spoiler i can't say it's a spoiler but in relation to the trolls there is a funny moment in the on the on do you guys remember the the when you encounter a troll on the rail line that uh, yes. on the train track yes yeah did you notice that okay we'll come back to it later i won't spoil it but that's a very interesting on the next take step. on on the on the troll mm-hmm. stuff I did find one out in the open world, just kind yes. of like there at like guarding a, a treasure chest or something. And I hadn't seen one in a while. And I was so fed up on them from replaying the last game. So I was like, come here. And I did All the right. elbow drop and like killed him in like a minute. And it felt so good. Yeah, but it also had the same um, execution animation. I'm the like, same oh, that's disappointing. Yeah. I was like, you should have mixed up that that animation a bit. You know there's going to be that's... there's going to be that. There's going to be a lot of people online. Like, I think we've already totally. seen it with like the boat animation from the trailer. And people are like, look, yeah. it's the same thing. I don't know. I mean, how many ways to paddle a boat while they come on? I'm dreading that part of the conversation. And I know it's a small part, don't get me wrong, but it's a loud part and it's annoying and it's at you, especially in what we do, because we'll be like, God of War is amazing. And then the next three months is a whole bunch of like. It's a PS4 you know, game, not a PS5 game. I've seen or a lot just of those, that. all that shit. And it'll be at you on Twitter. And it's like, how, how far do you have to reach? To, to to suggest that this is a shit game like how far mm. is that reached you know what i mean because i just it drives me crazy but i know that's what we're in for it's 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 all that sort of stuff people just bad faith arguments trying to convince you that this is somehow an ugly game or a shitty game or it's a dlc and it's like come on man like are you for real right now but this is what it, it is what it is it's that's how this whole discourse thing goes I think the people who were anticipating it are going to be very happy. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Straight for out. Sure. For sure. They show his dick. <laughs> Finally. Can we keep that in? Yes. <laughs> There's no way we're deleting it. So, yeah, 100%. <laughs> and by the way, when people come back in two weeks and there was no dick shot, oh they're going to be pissed. God. They're going to be like, Jake <laughs> promised me some Kratos. Oh, I bought God. the game because of you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Does he call it the world serpent? I mean, what? Yeah. Oh, oh, my oh, God. There it is. Oh, there it is. That is God. enough, young man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's enough from <laughs> me? You started it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Good place to finish on. Yeah. Kratos' dick. Yes. I love it. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's, a nice, that's a nice finish. I wish that's I could see Kratos' dick. <laughs> the ghost of you know, Sparta the time itself. Will come. Yeah. Right. The, the, the time will come. <laughs> oh boy should move well, this on before we get demonetized oh yeah yes. let's go ahead let's wrap up with some uh well actually let's do Fortnite and games first because mm. we got a good old trip down memory lane this week there are some bangers yeah so as a reminder going forward mm-hmm. uh Fortnite and games is now a group thing where we get to decide as a gr- individually what are games that we we get to enjoy uh you know i'll go first the game that came out uh, that I want to highlight to make you all feel old, 20, oh 21 years ago, SSX Tricky. It can drink. Oh, my God. <laughs> and you know it would party so hard yeah, as well. Yeah, it really SSX would. Tricky would get on it. Oh, absolutely. Big time. God damn. So, yep. yep. Garibaldi's Probably peak, the best man. use of a licensed song in a gameplay element yep. ever. Oh, yeah. Like, they stretched that song I so did. far. Every single level mm-hmm. had a SSX Tricky Remix version of Tricky. Just so good. <laughs> yeah. So good. Yeah. Fantastic. 
All right, what about you, Ralph? What's to... your game? Well, I did see that there was... Actually, Jake pointed this out to me that uh, 26 years ago on November 1st, 1996, Blood Omen Legacy of Kane arrived on the good old PlayStation. Oh, my God. Uh, which, you know, oldie but a goodie. Let's mm. just put it that way. Uh, <laughs> wink, wink, Crystal Dynamics. Get your fucking <laughs> act together. Uh, the other one I actually saw when I was scrolling down here was that Age of Mythology came out 20 years ago on November 1st, 2002. And I, it makes sense that I see that here because they just announced mm-hmm. a remaster of it, funnily enough. That yeah. was just announced as part of the anniversary. Ben Hansen like, yeah, is cool. so stoked, bless him. It's like his favorite game from Min Max. Oh, I love, I was That's I was great. always an Age of Mythology guy over an Empires guy. You know, I just loved it. I thought it was mm-hmm. awesome. So I'm actually super pumped about that. And um, yeah, man, 20 years ago. Fuck, it's crazy. Oh, um, Lucy, what do, what do we got with you? Okay, so I got two. One of them is Spyro 2, which is 23 years old. <laughs> Man, that's so crazy. Uh, so yeah, in America, you called it Ripto's Rage. In the UK yes. and Australia, we called it Gateway to Glimmer. Um, I wonder why we did that. I don't why know. would we call that something different? Was that like A B split testing to see which name would work better? Maybe. Like, that's so odd. I don't it's know why. You guys heard Ripto's Rage and you're like, ooh, that's scary. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's scary, <laughs> is it? <laughs> uh, but the other the other game this one made me deflate physically when i read it and that's dragon age origins <laughs> 13 years ago oh wow what a game though still holds up a eh? still a great game. hey Dreadwolf uh is in alpha now or whatever they it said this the other day so uh, that, that one, it's just uh i was it was a minute where i guess i was like not deep in gaming news so Dragon Age Origins, Origins for me just came out and I saw it and I was like, <laughs> oh shit, yeah, I'll buy that. Like reviews came out and they were good. I was like, Bioware just made yeah. another RPG. Like, all right. Yeah. And, and it, it was like, such a great, it was so their, great to just stumble into that. Was it their best one? Question mark. Like, mm, I mean, oh. Mass Effect. I mean, I, I think, but I, I think from a gameplay perspective, you still had, that was back when Bioware was still making PC games. Oh, you know what yeah. I mean? And like, yeah. And it was that kind of like Dungeons and Dragons thing. Yeah. Oh God! And it was and it was such a great hybrid because it had that kind of cinematic storytelling thing, while also some proper hardcore D and D inspired, oh, like yeah. you know, real time turn time um, combat that oh, was yeah. just awesome. And I just oh, I loved it so much. So I I don't know. I think maybe it's my favorite Bioware game actually. I think Mass Effect is cooler. Yeah. I love that universe more. But Mass Effect's gameplay is pretty ass. Uh, whereas Dragon Age is like top. Top shelf, man. Yeah. Top shelf. No, I, I, that's why I don't like Inquisition. It got all cat. It got way more casual. And it's I mean, like, yeah. When you when you go from two to two, where definitely yeah. um, enough said about two, the better. But like, yeah, definitely when it got to Inquisition, it took a while. I just felt like I was holding the button the whole time, you know. But totally. I did really enjoy totally. the story. I'm super excited to see where Dreadwolf goes. Especially, I don't know if you played the Trespasser DLC, but that was sick. That was. I heard. I haven't played really it. Really no, good. I heard it was good. Um, yeah, right. So no, I'm very excited for more Dragon Age. And yeah, 13 yeah. years, goddamn. Jake, what is your entry for this Fortnite I'm, game? I'm cheating also. I got I got two, but I got one to make you feel not so bad and one to make you feel old. So Star Wars Battlefront 2, the original one, the incredible one, the God tier one, if good you choice, will. Good choice. Uh released 17 years ago. Uh, on October thirty first, two thousand and five. It doesn't make me feel 17? good to say to hear that two thousand five was seventeen years ago. Yeah, I remember exactly where I was so when that like, game came number. out. <laughs> <laughs> on the yeah. other hand, I have Crash Bandicoot three Warped, which is think about this. This is the third game in the Crash series. That was twenty four years ago. That was oh November third, nineteen ninety eight. <laughs> Uh, oh the uh, crash 2 also released in this time period but I, I just wanted to pick the most recent one to show how even that's old <laughs> For some reason the playstation in my head only released in like the year 2001 and then i'm like yeah. no that was the playstation 2 ralph I'm like come yeah, on now homie. no i, st- <laughs> I <laughs> my head is still uh, 1970 was 30 years ago like that's where i'm at <laughs> oh you sure. do math like that too <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Well, that was good. Uh, let's let's just uh, wrap up with a nice little uh, casual viewer question. Mm, so yeah. we get these questions from you guys uh, submitted via email. The email is uh, 
Contact. We always forget. <laughs> Contact at friendspersecond.com or just hit us up on Twitter because we've got that too. Jake, you looked so, you looked so like convinced you, you were going to say it. You were like, <laughs> you just went, I was like, sorry, I was going to slam dunk. Slam dunk. <laughs> I'll get it eventually. So, I was getting going to the uh, questions. Christoph S. asks, uh, in an interview with Jeff Keighley, Lucy called him one of the infinity stones of the gaming industry. <laughs> I still think about Who, that. Who, <laughs> in your opinions, would be the other stones? Mm. That's hmm. a good question. Hideo Kojima is the easy answer. Yeah, of course. He's the only other person we follow on Twitter, by yeah. the way. And so Instagram. Just, yeah, um, and Instagram. <laughs> oh, the, I'm the gonna friends say per second account. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Masahiro yep. Sakurai. Yeah. Yep. Well, and, 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 and probably good. and probably Shigeru Miyamoto for yeah. that matter. Sure, 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 sure. I mean, Miyazaki. Mi- from Mi- from. Miyazaki. Miyazaki. He hates totally. being on camera and stuff, though, doesn't he? He does never okay? does it. Um, yeah. Yep. Who's like Corey down Balrog? to hang though? Like yeah, Ooh, like Corey Corey Balrog I'd put on there. Oh, too, Cole, for sure. Corey B. Yeah. yeah. I'd be totally down. 100 percent You should just message Corey. Um uh, are like non are they like non developers that are just like cool. Sean Layden, I actually really like his vibe. Uh whenever he talks, mm-hmm. I'm always interested to hear what he has to say. Uh so like him, I would definitely say. I would definitely say Phil Spencer. Yeah. He's like one film. of them. And then you like Jim Ryan. I mean, <laughs> okay. Listen, this is not a console thing, okay? Uh, we both, we all like, but the the fact is, it seems like it would be if, pretty cool to hang out with Phil. It seems like it would be not as fun to hang out with Jim Ryan. No disrespect to the man. What okay? about yeah. Herman? I, mean, just, I think Herman. Would be Herman good has chill. some interesting energy. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be cool to hang out with Herman. I think, yeah, for sure. Sam Lake. Sam Lake. I was think my, Sam yeah, would be very chill. Um, sure. Yeah, sure. That would just be the Chris Farley, like, hey, remember when you made Max Payne? That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> just the whole time. Your face. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, uh, Cliff Lazinski, man. Come on now. Happy, oh, be a wild happy Cliff Lazinski <laughs> book week, everyone. Yes. Yeah. Congrats. Yep. Um, yeah, I, yep. I like the old school vibe, too, like like a uh, Romero or. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Know. I, Carmack, Romero, and Blazinski on one podcast together. That'd be oh, sick. That'd be we should, get, we should, we make, should make that happen. happen. <laughs> that'd be crazy. <laughs> we should make that happen. I, I, so that'd be fun. I don't know how he would be in terms of like, I don't know if he would be down to clown, but I would <laughs> fucking love to talk to Will Wright. Like, oh, okay. The Sims is such oh. an integral part of my teenage and childhood years, but also I find the way that he designed that game and why he did the things that he did so fascinating like i just would love sure. to talk to him so he's great but I, I don't know if he would be down for the bands i don't know i've never i've never seen much um, stuff with him in sure he could sure, be sure fantastic for all i know amy amy hennig man yeah for sure would love to be would able to chat with her amy hennig. she has done some amazing stuff and that would be cool but i don't also don't know that she really, she doesn't really do many media appearances i don't think so i don't think that's um, possible not that I've seen anyway. Not that I've seen. Andy Wilson, of course. Love to have him on the podcast one day. Big fan of old mate Andy Wilson, of course. You know, so that'd be that'd be rad. Uh, hmm. Todd, Todd Howard. Todd. Todd Howard. Todd Howard would be good. Todd Howard would be Todd good to Howard. hang. Todd's uh good. he definitely uh people would be <laughs> mad that he's on here because he's like murdered <laughs> kids or something. I don't know. Like when you read comments, it sounds like he's t- the worst Todd man the in the world. It just it just works. He's it just works. I interviewed him once. Gabe he was he was, really, he was fun. He was good to chat he to. Was nice to chat to. We chatted to him about Fallout seventy six and. Uh, shit now. Yeah. What did he have to say? No, and it was about a year post launch, and he was quite candid about you know kind of where that okay. game went wrong, um, and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I met him and I told him that I I made a video. I made a top, I made top ten Todd Howard facts on the early <laughs> days of Game Ranks videos. <laughs> And he was like, yeah, I saw that. Oh, that was actually pretty oh, good. And I was like, oh, wow. And then now when I see him again, he's like, "That's you're the YouTube guy. And I was like, oh. oh yeah. <laughs> um, uh, actually, in terms of like, uh, speaking of Bethesda, uh, Harvey Smith, um, Dinga, uh, Bacaba from uh, sure. from Arcane, I think would be great. Yeah. Um, very chill. Yeah, totally. Totally. How about the creator of Vampire able- Survivors? Get them in. Get them in. Get them in. I don't know who they are, now. but absolutely whoever they are. Now, get them in. in now. What are we Book waiting em. for? Book them. <laughs> <laughs> They're Italian, right? Book They're Italian, em. yeah? Oh, yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna get yeah, okay, right. Okay, cool. Okay. We got one more question right. on, the, on the list here, right? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to read it? Sure. Uh, 
Malik S asks, what are some of the moments you've experienced while playing a game that have elicited a genuine emotional reaction from you, i.e. joy, tears, fear, etc.? Can I go first? Mine, mine's, a, mine's a short one. Yeah. Go I want to surprise people. Subvert your expectations. Mm. Uh, rage. Pure rage. I am a rage gamer. Uh, oh, I sick. have put a Guitar Hero controller through a, a wall. Oh my god, um, yes. Oh my yes. god. <laughs> <laughs> Tough I've thrown controllers. Jake. <laughs> Me, Jake yeah, talk, I, Dark Jake. Dark <laughs> Jake is rising. Jake. Yeah, it's what was very the song? rare. What was the song? What happens? <laughs> oh man, I don't remember what it was. It was probably like um <laughs> like Jess like do 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 it gets really yeah. freaking. I thought you were about to say Jesse's girl and I was like mm. I don't know if that man oh, no. DLC for Rockman? Yeah. Oh, actually, uh, Matthew's sweet girlfriend. I remember getting pretty hard. I was stuck on that one for a while to like crack that on expert. Mm -hmm. Um that's also just a really good song. Did you ever do um, Fire and Flames on Expert? Did you ever get that one? I just never even bothered with that. Never That's a young man's that, game. Herman By that time, I was like an old like Guitar Hero player. I was like, ah. <laughs> Herman Lee's TikTok, by the way, uh, he's in Dragon Force and he's a guitarist. He has a TikTok where he kind of like reviews people a lot it's Doing very no good oh that's that's yeah. great he also oh i gotta find that every every video that he posts he has the top comment and he pins it it's just him saying herman lee <laughs> which is great <laughs> i don't know why he does it <laughs> legend absolute legend so you're a rage oh, gamer okay that's awesome that's, that's, what about i'm gonna re-examine how i approach you like no no wait, but i just never i never thought you had those layers <laughs> i never thought you had that oh, rage no. deep inside love it ralph love what it. A, like kratos what about you ralph um i would say i still remember seeing uh, there's two games i remember seeing for the first time where my brain kind of melted the first one was mario 64 where i saw it and i'm like literally my head was like i can't actually make sense of this like what is actually happening you know the first time i saw 3d gameplay like that it was that level of what the fuck the other one was Soul Calibur, actually, which I remember seeing at like a Harvey Norman. Harvey Norman was like a Best Buy here. And they had a Dreamcast that they imported from Japan and they set it up. And I still remember to this day just being like, what the fuck is this? That was just, as I said, it, my brain could not like process that something would look that good. I think the only other one was like uh, the end of Out of Wilds. If anyone, does anyone, does anyone guys finish Out of Wilds? I I desperately okay. want to. I will not say anything then, mm. but I would say that that was a very a very unique experience it was a mix of euphoria and melancholy and it was very very powerful and moving and uh yeah i, I don't think any game has like affected me that strongly in its ending than that one has mm. so yeah man lucy. number one's outer wilds influencer right here mm. let's go lucy what about you mass effect 3 but not for the reason you think i um a lot of people were upset about morden I was very upset about um, Grunt because I thought Grunt had died. <laughs> and they really did. They really faked it out. <laughs> they really fake it out. And uh, I, because actually on my first playthrough, I saved Morden because I don't know how. Um, I didn't know he could die. Um, but no, the the Grunt thing in, the, in Mass Effect 3 when he's uh, coming out from the Rachni Queen, for sure. Um, I would say as well... This is more of an unexplainable feeling because it's a mix of, like Ralph said about Outer Wilds, like melancholy, joy, a deep, profound malaise and sadness, but also with a tinge of hope. Uh, there's a moment in Disco Elysium where Kim and, and Detective, I'm not going to spoil it because him not knowing his own name is a plot point. Um, <laughs> but there's a point where they kind of just sitting on the swings together waiting for some ice to defrost and it's like mm. oh, it's like so powerful and it's just such a beautiful moment in a game that is so everything like that's that's yeah, how to describe that game it's everything yeah. and um it's yeah I, and actually you know our game of the year deliberations for 2019 there was the disco elysium people versus the outer wilds people and it was and just the outer wilds people won no the sekiro people won unfortunately well it was oh that's right yeah. this, you mean the game spot yeah crew, game right? spot game i was thinking, the, yeah. about, I was thinking the, the giant yeah. bomb people but oh yeah, no yeah, and yeah, uh yeah, sure, sure, sure. and so yeah it was just like <laughs> who can be more won. sad <laughs> but not explain why it's so true it's so true
all three of those games. Yep. <laughs> Sekiro, Outer Wilds, and Disco Elysium, all morbidly bleak. Yep. Just, <laughs> yep, totally. Jake? Gerard, hit us. Uh, I think I told you, we, we, I think I told you guys this one during one of our mock podcasts. For those of you who don't mm. know, we, we practiced doing this podcast for many, many months before we debuted our first mm. episode with y'all. So, the lost um, chapters, yeah. lost chapters that no one will hear are secrets. Um, mm. the game that makes me cry every single time I play it. Because you know there's nothing you can do and you just have to sit there and watch it unfold every single time is Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII, which Ooh. is about to get yeah. a port. Just in time to remastered. ruin your Christmas. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, have you guys played this game? Know anything about it at all? I actually haven't played it. I'm going to be playing it in December when the, when the remaster okay. launches. Uh, yeah. the, but don't spoil for me, please. <laughs> it's... I, I can't. I can't then. Okay. I can't tell you why it's it's incredible. But uh okay. Okay. um just the theme the theme of the game and 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 being a hero and doing the right thing in the face of adversity and evil and like what evil is is a consistent change that, that happens throughout the game. And the main character refuses to change his principles and believes in being the ultimate hero. And the last scene of the game is like the culmination of that theme. Uh leading into the events of Final Fantasy VII. And so the, the whole time you're just sitting there watching this thing unfold and mechanically the game is forcing you to see the events play out. Like it's reminding you, this is the journey you went on and we're just gonna, it's like a peeling a banana slowly. Like you're just gonna see it happen in real time. And it just, every time I play it, it just hits me in the heart. And uh, which is why Final Fantasy VII Remake is so fascinating because it alludes to things that 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 evolved and, and may be different and straying from the path. So the fact that Crisis Core is getting a remaster and that the fact that everyone's going to play it for the first time is something I'm so excited for people to play. Hashtag Zach Fair is better than Cloud. Fight me. I don't care. <laughs> Zach Fair is the best character in Final Fantasy VII. Oh, I'm excited. Mic drop. I've heard yeah, I've said. heard that before. Yeah. Already. And that's... It's too good. I can't... Ralph, did you did you play remake? Did you like seven yeah, remake? I then, loved it. Yeah, then I, and I saw and I saw that stuff, and I know yeah. I know the arc. I've heard of the arc of uh, the, what this is. Like I yeah. have the broad strokes in my head, but haven't actually experienced it for myself. So I I I cannot wait. I I don't care if you make a video on it. I'd love to just talk to you about it because I'd love <laughs> to get your insight. So. Oh. Thankfully, Yo, we have a podcast for that. Yo. It's called Yo. the Friends for Second Podcast. Hey, hey, that's this podcast every what a good idea. other week. Uh, it's available on all the major podcast platforms and graciously hosted uh, in video form on Scallop's channel, of course. Uh, we appreciate the reviews and the likes like on the podcast platforms. That legit helps. So mm. thank you. But we'd love to know what you think of this episode. Definitely let us know. I'm at Jake Baldino. You can find me on Instagram and YouTube oh. at Jake Baldino. Not really on Twitter as much. Uh, Ralph, what about you? Uh, I'm still unfortunately on Twitter uh, for now. And... Uh, <laughs> You'll find me here on this channel and on Skill Up because that's that's the name of the channel. It's Skill Up. I'm starting. As, I'm finishing as strong as I started. <laughs> <laughs> Banger. Come full circle. Back. <laughs> Lucy. Uh, I'm at Lucy James Games on uh, everything. I'm a day job. I work at Gamespot and Giant Bomb. And that's my cat. <laughs> Nice. Uh, I'm I'm Peanut. <laughs> I'm Peanut. I'm... You can find me at Lucy's apartment. <laughs> you can find me Asking wanting food. more food. <laughs> uh, I'm Gerard the Completionist. You can find me at Completionist on Twitter. That one, Video Gamer on YouTube, or just search the Completionist. You'll see my dumb bearded face and it's a beautiful face. Come on, thank you, thank with you. With a braid. In with a braid, I'm, tr I'm trying the trying it. the bearded look. Thank you, the braided look. I'm, I'm giving it a shot. I'm sure a lot of you in the comments are going to comment on it, but hey, that's okay. I appreciate any thoughts, at all. Thank you, thank you, Jake, for hosting. You yeah. did a great yeah. job today. Thank you, man. As thank always. you. I always get nervous. I'm awkward. I have a question. Is are you going to like keep doing more braids? Is this like a full? Mm. I think so. I think one, this is like the beginning. I'm trying the one, and eventually, if I turn into a character from Days Gone, don't be surprised. So okay. cool. Sick. That's dope. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, is this one. is this the beard reveal too? Is this the first? Uh, 
Are we getting the podcast this, this, exclusive this, of this? The, the braid? Yeah, this is a, a brand new look I've, I've never done before. Wow. So Polygon, yeah. Kotaku, write the articles. <laughs> we, need, we need headlines. I could. So beard I, reveal. Yes, I could, I could use the positive press for once. Thank you to all those out there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys very much for watching, listening. We'll see you in the next one. I'm Jake Baldino. Tie your shoes and go to bed. <laughs>